Good morning, everyone, and thank you for coming. I'm Council Member Robert Carnegie, Chair of the Council's Committee on Housing and Buildings. Uh, we're here to discuss intro. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm joined by Council Member Margaret Chin. Uh, and we're here to discuss intro 1004, sponsored by Council Member Lander, which would create a pilot program facilitating the conversion of basements and cellars of certain one, two, one and two family homes in East New York into legal, habitable apartments. HPD will primarily will be primarily responsible for managing and administering this program. With over 11 million budgeted for this purpose, if successful, this program could be scaled citywide and create an estimated 5,000 affordable housing units. There are thousands of unauthorized housing units throughout the city, many of which exist in illegally converted basements. Tenants illegally converted basements often live in substandard conditions, and they're more likely to have very limited rights to the unit. This program will render certain basements both safe and legal, creating legitimate, quality, affordable housing and additional property value for participating homeowners. Today, we anticipate testimony from the administration, real estate representatives, tenant advocates, and other stakeholders and interested members of the public. We look forward to learning more about the details, objectives, and supports to be provided by this program, as well as any concerns that this program presents. As a reminder of those who testify today, please be sure to fill out a card with the sergeant. With that said, I'm going to call up representatives from the administration as our first panel. Oh. Hands up. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Carnegie and members of the New York City uh, Council on Housing and Buildings. My name is Kim Darga, and I'm the Associate Commissioner of Preservation with the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development, HPD. With me today are my colleagues, Matt Murphy, Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Strategy at HPD, Julian Basil, Cold Counsel at the New York City Fire Department, Gus Sirakis, Assistant Commissioner for Technical Affairs and Code Development at the Department of Buildings, and Christopher Holm, Senior Planner at the Department of City Planning. I'm excited to testify today on Intro 1004 uh, and the City's demonstration program to facilitate the renovation and creation of apartments in basements and cellars of certain one and two family dwellings in Brooklyn Community District 5. Basement and cellar apartments have been a topic of interest for at least 90 years in New York City, today is an important step to address their existence and explore how they may be converted to legal safe housing. Introduced by Council Members Lander, Espinal, and Barron at the request of the Mayor, this bill reflects the efforts of a two-year working group and joint recognition between the City Council and Administration that innovative tools are needed to address the City's affordable housing crisis. In conversations during the East New York rezoning process, the community specifically called for a pilot program to look at converting basement and cellar apartments. I especially thank Councilmember Espinal for his leadership on this issue. Affordable housing is one of the biggest concerns that New Yorkers face and one of the top priorities of Mayor de Blasio's administration. The estimated population growth in New York City between 2010 and 2017 was around 400,000 people. This is a population comparable to New Orleans or Miami. To confront this migration, we are making every effort to add housing at a variety of income levels. This helps provide relief in the rental market, which holds a stubbornly low vacancy rate at 3.63%, according to the 2017 Housing and Vacancy Survey. The Mayor's Comprehensive Housing Plan accelerated and expanded through Housing New York 2.0 to finance 300,000 affordable homes by 2026 is a critical pillar of a broader agenda to keep the city affordable, competitive, and sustainable. We are here today to take the first steps to enable and encourage homeowners to turn their basements into legal and safe apartments. While New York City remains a majority renter city, it is vital that homeowners have the tools to participate in housing solutions we need to confront our housing, especially affordable housing, shortage. Although the economy has improved since the foreclosure crisis and recession, many New York City homeowners struggle to cover basic home expenses, including mortgage payments and needed repairs, and still make ends meet. Because of New York City's high-value real estate market, it is not unheard of for aggressive speculators to barrage vulnerable owners with cash offers, knowing that those with significant maintenance issues will be tempted to accept, 
even if it means leaving the neighborhood where they hold vital social networks, and even if it is not enough for them to secure another home or apartment they can afford. In some cases, homeowners have converted their existing cellars or basements into informal rental units for additional income to pay the bills. While renting a basement or cellar can reduce financial vulnerability for the homeowner, conditions in these units are often far from ideal. They can leave renters in unsafe units that do not provide adequate light, ventilation, and egress, or meet certain non-combustible construction requirements. Chaya Community Development Corporation estimates that over 100,000 households live in informal units, including illegal basement and cellar apartments across the city, with many without leases and in conditions that fail to meet the minimum safety standards in the city's housing and construction codes. Tenants and owners do not always uh, know that existing regulations and laws have requirements making many of those basement and cellar units illegal to be inhabited. Many of these mandates are the result of an era in which one of the largest housing issues was the co connection of negative health outcomes and poor housing conditions. Today, these unregulated units are often occupied by some of the city's most housing unstable populations or those less likely to engage with government agencies regarding their housing conditions. It is in these situations that tenants are not likely calling 311 for peeling paint, lack of smoke detectors, or other uh, potentially serious conditions. If a complaint is made and a city inspector sees an unauthorized below grade unit that is deemed unsafe, for example, because it lacks means of emergency escape and rescue openings in case of a fire, the city must order the tenant to vacate the unit. I want to take a moment to know that these, note that these homeowners are often doing what they can to take care of their families and may otherwise be well-intentioned landlords. Because they are not in the business of large-scale development or property management, many homeowners may not know that these basic safety requirements exist at all. Even if they do, major obstacles to creating legal basement and cellar apartments in existing one and two family homes include complexities of overseeing and managing construction and the prohibitive costs of bringing such apartments into compliance. Modifying certain code requirements in conjunction with requiring additional safety measures specific to basement and cellar apartments would protect and promote the health and safety of tenants in these units. In order to provide a stable income stream to homeowners and add safety, quality apartments to the housing stock, the city is proposing modified standards for homeowners to legalize the occupancy of these basements or cellars. Too often, these apartments exist in the shadows, and there is much to be learned to make sure that the city is offering the right forms of assistance and protection. As such, we seek approval of a demonstration pro program with these goals in Community District 5. First, to evaluate, modif or sorry, evaluate modified housing standards that do not compromise resident or responder safety while increasing the number of viable below grade units. Second, to identify and engage willing homeowners to participate in the creation or renovation of below grade housing units. Third, to produce public financing instruments and identify private financing opportunities to develop or conduct renovation on below grade housing units and ultimately from this work, determine if the approaches can be implemented citywide by examining the impact and feasibility of basement and cellar housing standards, um, engagement approaches, and public and private financing opportunities. The geographic location for this demonstration program is ideal because of the physical and economic factors in the area. Brooklyn's CD5, including East New York and Cypress, Cypress Hills, asked for such a program during the East New York rezoning conversations, which is reflected in the East New York Commitments Tracker. It is the ideal location for the launch of a, the demonstration program because of the housing stock and the presence of knowledgeable community-based organizations. It includes a uniquely concentrated stock of older buildings with diverse zoning and housing types, but most importantly, of all community districts in Brooklyn, illegal basement occupancy is estimated to be the most common in this area. The community was also one of the New York neighborhoods hardest hit by the foreclosure crisis. Today, 10 years after the foreclosure crisis, CD5 has the fourth highest rate of new mortgage foreclosure actions among homeowners in the city. Additionally, 59% of homeowners in the district are cost burdened, 47% are low income, 
and 140 of every 10,000 one to three family homes has, their, uh, has had their tax lien sold in 2016 and 2017, suggesting homeowner financial distress. HPD is deeply committed to providing struggling homeowners with the resources and services they need to stay in their homes and neighborhood. As part of Housing New York 2.0, HPD announced the Home Fix program to help existing low and moderate income homeowners in one to four family properties fund home repairs. There is high demand for these relatively small loans to help families who do not have access to the private lending market. Through the new program, financial assistance will be paired with financial counseling to address the full spectrum of needs of families struggling to cover basic expenses and mortgage payments while also paying for home repairs. The Center for New York City Neighborhoods, CNYCN, or the Center, is a nonprofit organization created in 2008 in response to the foreclosure crisis through the collaborative efforts of the mayor, HPD, the New York City Council, community advocates, foundations, and corporate leaders. The Center and its network partners offer high quality housing counseling and legal services free of charge to meet the diverse needs of New York homeowners. HPD manages contracts with CNYCN to procure foreclosure prevention services via network partners, local community-based organizations who deliver financial and legal counseling in neighborhoods. In addition, CNYCN attends homeowner resource fairs that HPD hosts in different neighborhoods. Further, the East New York Homeownership Help Desk is run by the Center for New York City Neighborhoods under contract with HPD in collaboration with the Office of Councilmember Espinal. Launched in 2017, help, the Help Desk offers a range of services, including advice and assistance with foreclosure prevention, guidance on scam avoidance, advice on home repair, and other programs like weatherization loans. As part of this program, the Center has conducted outreach to over 3,000 homeowners, hosted 12 outreach events, and educated 2,000 homeowners with foreclosure prevention, financial, and legal counseling. Today's proposed legislation will build on this important work by allowing for the conversation, or sorry, the conversion of a current basement or cellar in an existing single family home in CD5 into a new legal apartment through the modifications of current code requirements. Each proposed modification in the standards regulated by the city's codes took into account the safety of the occupants of these apartments. These modified standards include added health and safety measures such as sprinkler, sprinklers, radon testing, and waterproofing. To complement the legislative mod modifications, the city has uh, allocated funds for an HPD financing program that will assist homeowners in undertaking these renovations. Existing low and moderate income homeowners will have access to financial and technical assistance through HPD's basement apartment conversion program. Through the program, HPD will provide low and no cost or sorry, no interest loans to renovate a basement or cellar into a validly habitable apartment. This spring, the mayor's public engagement unit, PEU, conducted outreach to 420 homeowners in East New York and Cypress Hills to understand the viability of and homeowner interest in a potential basement conversion pilot program. Six bilingual outreach staff did door-to-door -door and phone outreach to homeowners and collected basic self-reported information on household income, household size, and existing basement or cellar conditions. PEU had a 90% response rate among contacted homeowners, over 30% of which expressed interest in participating in a potential future pilot program. Homeowners reported the potential for earning income from renting their converted basement or cellar as the primary motivating factor for participating in a future program. In addition to the funding, to funding renovations, HPD will oversee a contract with a nonprofit program administrator to assist, assist participating homeowners. Based on a request for expressions of interest, HPD has identified a consortium of community-based organizations, CBOs, to administer the pilot program on behalf of HPD for 40 homeowners and is in the process of negotiating a contract with this group. This includes working with homeowners to apply for and close on financing from the agency and access other appropriate assistance. With help from the CBOs, the owners will work directly with qualified contractors to renovate their apartments in compliance with the modified standards from the local law. The CBOs will also help any existing tenants residing in currently illegal units by providing guidance and financial resources if temporary relocation is required during construction. 
As the head of all residential preservation programs in the city, I focus on keeping people in affordable homes every day. I want to be clear, I do not want this program to result in the eviction of existing tenants. At HPD, protecting tenants is at the core of our work. Looking at our experience with other single-family homeownership programs, I'm committed to finding a path that balances the financial stability for the homeowner with tenant protections. We have had a number of conversations with homeowners, council members, advocates, and the contracted CBOs in developing the requirements of this program. We will continue those conversations to strike the right balance of flexibility and support of all participants. Flexibility is important to quickly respond to situations that arrive during this pilot, which will present both challenges and opportunities along the way. In order to find program participants, the Mayor's Public Engagement Unit will perform additional outreach to homeowners in East New York and Cypress Hills to inform them about the basement conversion program, determine interest in the program, and connect potential participants to the CBO and HPD who will conduct further screening to determine feasibility and eligibility. PEU will employ multilingual uh, specialists with fluency in key languages that do uh, outreach over the course of approximately 12, reach to over, sorry, 12 weeks to over 8,000 homeowners identified by the Department of City Planning. Based on the initial outreach earlier this year, the city expects a smaller number of homeowners will be interested in the program and complete an initial home assessment from which CB, the CBO and city will identify 40 final participants. Outreach may include in-person door knocking, phone calls, and mailings, and will be coordinated with relevant stakeholders, including community-based organizations and council members. At the end of the three-year pilot, we will evaluate the program and have a better understanding of best practices and challenges for adopting or adapting this program or potentially considering other conversion programs at a greater scale. This evaluation will be key to providing facts to a debate that has been underway for more than eight decades, whether we can or should look underground to help us create yet another source of affordable and decent housing. Because we are always looking for innovative solutions to, that meet the needs of New Yorkers where, we, where they live, today we hope to shed light on unregulated basement and cellar units and outline a path to more easily convert these spaces into safe, habitable apartments. It is my hope that the basement and cellar demonstration program within Community District 5 will provide important information about the impacts of legalizing these units on a wider scale while providing a stable income stream to homeowners and adding safe quality apartments to the housing stock. Thank you for your time and I look forward to any questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I just want to acknowledge the presence of Councilmember Bill Perkins, Councilmember Brad Landa, Councilmember Barry Gradenchik, Councilmember Carlina Rivera, Councilmember Jamani Williams, and Councilmember Fernando Cabrera. Uh, I've been joined uh, by my co-chair, uh, and at this time I'd like for him to be able to give his opening remarks. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in trying to make ends meet and hold on to the family's biggest asset, Many households across the city have leased out their basements as apartments. This needed source of income is often illegal due to safety hazards, yet bringing the units up to code requires construction that would send many of these homes into foreclosure. I'm, pr I'm proud that this basement pilot program is going to take place in East New York, which is home to a resilient community of low-income families who use their homes as sources of critical income, but every day risk fines that could ruin their lives. We need this program because it does not pit the safety of tenants against the needed income of homeowners. An elderly constituent recently came to my office, overwhelmed and distraught at the thousands of dollars she had been fined for renting out her basement to a formerly homeless family. The family had been evicted because her basement had not been up to code. Her financial security was ruined because of the expenses she was forced to pay, and she was devastated that her neighbors were forced to live in a hotel for years. Though the apartment wasn't safe to live in, it provided a home to people who otherwise would not have a home. This woman's story demonstrates the careful balance this program needs to strike, one that protects homeowners and tenants alike. Low-income homeowners across New York experienced, some ho some ex experienced more foreclosures this past year than they have since 2009. Yet when we talk about our city's housing crisis, this entire population is often left out. This pilot program is an essential first step in what we hope will be a citywide program to replace the risk of burdensome fines with secure and affordable apartments. 
It must include compassionate loans for homeowners who want to follow the law but are financially restrained from doing so. And it must include affordable rents for tenants who, if priced out, are at risk of becoming homeless. There is an affordable housing crisis in this city, and this program must be a part of solving it. I also want to add that this program is a, actually uh, came out of the East New York uh, neighborhood plan, and it was through tough negotiations that we were actually able to push the mayor's office uh, to, agree, to agree to do this, and working with uh, great groups in the community, like Cypress Hills Local Development, um, we were able to get to this point. We spent the past two years uh, having tough conversations and negotiations with HPD on figuring out what is the best way to move forward, and that in result turned into a bill and that my great colleague Brad Lander is carrying, and I'm hoping to continue working together to make it into reality. Thank you. Uh, as it was mentioned by um, my co-chair, uh, the prime sponsor of the bill is Councilmember Brad Lander, and I'd like to give him an opportunity to speak on his bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, Councilmember Espinal, and HBD and the administration team for being here. Um, this is a pilot program that's a long time in coming. I was looking back last night at the report that we put out at the Pratt Center, New York's Housing Underground, a Refuge and Resource, April 16, 2009. Uh, and that actually built on work that had been done by Chaya, and I want to call them out for their longstanding organizing and Citizens Housing and Planning Council. Um, we've got a real opportunity here, and I'm glad with the deliberation that we're approaching it. Um, you know, at that time, we thought it was about 100,000 units. Part of the challenge here, of course, is getting good data. I suspect it's actually a lot more than that today. Um, and I appreciate the work that has gone in. I want to give a special credit to Councilmember Espinal for his work in East New York. Part of what has long been needed over all these years, I think there's long been recognition that there are a lot of occupied underground units, um, that they provide critical housing to hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers, um, but that we have to balance some challenging issues about health and safety, about owners, about tenants, if we're going to do it. And for a while, the idea that a pilot program would help us figure that out has been straightforward, but what neighborhood would step up and take responsibility to work to do it has not been simple. So I want to say thank you to East New York, to Cypress Hills LDC, and especially Councilmember Espinal for taking the leadership to move us forward. This is, in some ways, a relatively modest pilot program, 40 homes, but it's the opportunity to work out a lot of hard questions and see if we can come up with something uh, at a scale that genuinely addresses this issue more broadly and provides something that is an essential element of our broader affordable housing and comprehensive solution. Um, and I'll just second, I think we're all mindful of the challenges we face. We need to have units that are safe and habitable. We need our firefighters to be safe when they go into units. We need first and foremost occupants to be safe living in those units. And then we also need to balance um, the issues facing homeowners and tenants, and in a lot of situations, especially in East New York, that's a challenge on both fronts. So many of the homeowners that will be eligible for the subsidy program uh, will be low-income families who might otherwise be facing foreclosure challenges in maintaining their homes. I think we also want to recognize that the tenants in these units, and this is true across the board, not just in East New York, the tenants who occupy basement and underground housing units are overwhelmingly low-income families, largely immigrant families, um, who don't have options to find decent, safe, affordable housing in New York City and have occupied these units because that's what they can find. We need to make sure the program that we develop provides adequate tenant protections and affordability so we don't create a different problem uh, in solving this one. I appreciate the work that the administration has done so far in dialogue with us and all the stakeholders to try to get there and to look forward to bringing this bill forward to passage and then seeing the program get implemented in a way that really helps to carry us forward. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, so we're going to begin the portion uh, of questions from myself and my colleagues. Uh, before I hand the mic over to um, my co-chair, Espinal, I just have a couple of questions, and I want to give some context before I get started. Um, I am cautiously optimistic about the program, uh, and the reason that is is uh, there's an old adage deep southern adage that says, be careful not to fatten frogs for snakes. And if you could, not that I advocate for the fattening of frogs or snakes, but what, it's, what it means is that sometimes we'll um, work really hard on a particular thing just to have it uh, either be monitored or find and feed or, uh, so you ask people to come into the, um, 
into the above ground industry, and then ultimately they suffer. And so uh, as it was mentioned by the, by the, the bill sponsor, most of these homeowners in this particular program and those who access their basements for uh, conversion uh, around the city are low-income immigrant families who may not be as well-versed in the system, so education is going to be tremendously important uh, in this so that they can be in compliance and not get in compliance and, and then fall out of compliance. So that's what we've seen uh, as the former chair of the Committee on Small Business, uh, we would see um, a program that brought small business owners, largely immigrant, into a system um, and gave them initial help, but didn't help them through all the steps and they would fall out of compliance and then be the target for enforcement. So that's what I, you know, that's the context by which uh, makes me cautiously optimistic. So um, are there, so, and, and I kind of know anecdotally some of the answers to the questions. I'm hoping that we can get the statistical data to support it. Um, are there neighborhoods or areas of the city where illegal basement apartments are particularly common? So I'll answer that. Uh, it's Matt Murphy from HPD. Um, there are specific areas of the city where it's estimated to be more common. Um, that doesn't mean this isn't a citywide issue. Um, but there are going to be uh, parts of the city where it's just less common. Um, in terms of this specific area, Community District 5 in East New York, um, while violations on our side, the data that we have, aren't necessarily perfect predictors of the problem, um, they're about as good as it gets in, term in, in, in terms of determining possible concentration. Um, in Community District 5 in East New York, uh, between 2013 and 2018, um, there were actually, of all the community districts in Brooklyn, uh, had the highest rate of violations per 10,000 units. It's actually about three times uh, the Brooklyn average and about three and a half times the citywide average. Um, so this particular area where the pilot is um, taking place is um, an area where, uh, or a neighborhood where it, it is understood to be common. Um, there are other areas of the city um, where uh, it's been reported and where the violations data would show, but as mentioned in, the, um, in Councilmember Espinal's uh, statement, uh, this also takes a, um, a partnership with the community district and growing out as a commitment to the community f through the rezoning. Uh, on top of that, East New York homeowners, as has been described, um, were kind of targeted for subprime loans uh, and was very much ground zero for the foreclosure crisis in addition to um, other low income, primarily African American neighborhoods um, and also more likely to be low income and cost burden. So that is a, you know, there is a, a reason that this demonstration program is targeted um, to this area. So speaking of targeting, uh, one of the reasons that I'm cautiously optimistic because currently we're demanding um, from the Office of Special Enforcement the zip codes where they've specially enforced around uh, uh, the issues related to Airbnb usage. Um, because anecdotally, we've, you know, we found that it's primarily in uh, communities of color where that enforcement is taking place. And, you know, which gives me pause and concern where families have been operating um, you know, below just meeting their margins based on the subprime uh, mortgage and foreclosure uh, uh, debacle. Um, so I, I really just want to be careful where I can see this can be uh, incredibly helpful to families. I want to make sure uh, that the unintended consequences uh, are not um, in the forefront. So w you, you've, you've, you've discussed some of the positive impacts in that it could potentially add more affordable housing units. What are the risks that are associated with basement conversions from sure. your perspective? Sure, so I'll start by saying, you know, it, it, I think it's really helpful to look at the risks of the existing conditions, so prior to conversion. And, and those really break out into three primary populations we've thought about, tenants, uh, owners, and first responders. Um, and so, for on the tenant side, the, the current risk of uh, habiting a unit is that because of their nature as being below ground, 
they're more likely to be susceptible to, to moisture, um, which leads to mold conditions and asthma conditions. So there's a health risk associated with these units. As uh, Commissioner Darga mentioned in her testimony, um, this has been an, a, a 90 year conversation where there was an effort to bring people out of this type of housing, um, you know, not that long ago, um, but still quite a long time ago in our, in, in our context. Um, and they were brought out for health reasons. So it has to be understood that there are health risks um, in exi any sort of existing uh, conditions. Um, on top of that, there is the uh, risk of being in an informal, informal housing situation, maybe not having a lease, uh, having a handshake agreement with a landlord. Uh, this puts people at the risk of displacement without really any understanding or context to existing rights because they're not documented in a way. Um, and what we found in our working group is that there are many situations like that. Um, on the owner side, the risk is really the risk of, that you mentioned, uh, that you are violating the law um, and you're a 311 complaint away from either a neighbor or the tenant uh, from there being an HPD inspector who is looking at the unit and determining it to be an illegal unit. Um, and so that is a risk for, for them on, the, on that side, but also um, to the extent they are financed and have a mortgage, a mortgage lender will look very unfavorably upon that. So it takes you out of the credit market. Um, and then finally, the risk for first responders, as FDNY can say as well, is immense. Um, basement fires are inherently more difficult to fight um, because uh, our firefighters have to go down while the smoke and uh, fire is coming up. Um, and they may not know that there's a family living in the basement. Um, there is, they may not uh, have the, uh, you know, an idea of the exact conditions of that basement and whether to expect that. Um, so they really break out into, into several ways and when you add on that the building mechanicals uh, tend to be in basements and below ground, um, that, that ri has risk for responders and, and tenants as well. So you've clearly illustrated um, right now before the conversion program where the, um, where the barriers to success could lie. What's the remedy to change that through the conversion program? So you've mentioned um, mechanicals, like that's not necessarily gonna change. Mechanicals still remain in the basement. Um, means of egress uh, or going below ground still remains the same. What, what are the, 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 the exact barriers that you pointed out? How are they remedied through the conversion program? Yeah, so that's a great question. So in, in, in a way, in a few ways and that touch on all of that. Um, so the barriers that a homeowner faces in converting today under the current um, provisions uh, are huge cost implications uh, and that has to do with the housing maintenance code, uh, the building code, the fire code um, and these cost implications make it almost completely infeasible if not impossible for a homeowner to pursue this work. Um, and so we're balancing here in the conversion program, uh, looking to reduce those costs, um, and, but also introducing those mitigating factors. So for example, um, the current housing code requires that there is a solid 12 square foot window. And I apologize for getting technical, but that's really important to understand that that's actually really hard to, um, to do under the current pro code provisions because there's not enough actual room to put a window like that in. And so a specific amendment that we've made is to allow that to be spread over two windows, which is feasible after talking to design people. As well, on the, um, on the boiler uh, and um, carbon monoxide kind of risk point, um, we've added in uh, specific types of walls that have to be built in. So instead of outright prohibiting occupancy of that unit to say that you have to actually build a, a fire rated wall that makes it a safer and more habitable condition for a tenant should they be living there. We've also put on additional egress requirements and my colleague Gus Karakas can talk to this. Um, and then the ventilation issue and the moisture issue that, that I also discussed that we've put in specific provisions that allow for it 
to be a balanced quality of life uh, for the tenant without it being cost prohibitive for the owner. Mike, Gus Sarakis from the New York City Department of Buildings. So yeah, to, in addition to what Matt uh, has already mentioned, this was a, a multi-agency effort to consider the safety of these units and to make sure that we were not, you know, uh, uh, imposing any uh, uh, safety hazards on folks uh, as part of this program. So we have also the addition of um, the mandate of fire sprinklers in these spaces, the requirement that the egress stairs comply with the latest building code standards from the outside to be able to get in so that it's not just uh, some maybe a bill code door or something along those lines that it's a new code compliant stair. Um, the sleeping rooms will also be required to have what's called an occupant evacuation opening, which is a, a window of a particular size, not 12 feet per se, but at least the, the right size and without obstructions to, to allow someone to escape if there was need either for a first responder to get them out or for them to get out because one of the, uh, the it was the easiest path of evacuation for them during those conditions. And DEP was involved, the health department was involved, the fire department was involved, HPD was involved. So there was a lot of consideration put in also to um, the occupancy standards, including the uh, light wells and how you can get light and air down to these spaces and making sure that if you were digging out to put in a kind of a, a, a light well to allow air and, and light to come in, that the light well was of sufficient width to allow light to actually come into the room. So my last question before I pass it on is, uh, I'm curious, um, in this new pot, in the new zoned pilot program, if a homeowner is unable to come under compliance, what happens to that homeowner and subsequently the tenants in that homeowner's building? So if an owner is unable, so in terms of how the pilot program works, so the, the legislation we're discussing today is about allowing for um, one family homes to add an additional unit and for two family homes to add a uh, sleeping space basically into uh, the unit. In addition to this legislation, which does amend um, certain provisions that do make it uh, more, uh, um, that, that do create a path for homeowners, um, we are doing the demonstration program on the financing and lending side. So we're procuring a community-based organization, and Commissioner Darga can speak more to this, uh, to work with individual homeowners to seek financing both from HPD and potentially uh, private sources um, to do this work. It's creating a path today that just simply does not exist because of the barriers that we mentioned. Um, and so in the case that somebody through these, this path also is unable to um, achieve compliance, we will be in the same state as we are in today um, however, there will be a lot of resources and a program and money and a community-based organization with strong ties to, to the neighborhood to be able to understand what path can somebody take if it's available to them. In terms of the types of complaints we receive, um, one of the things we found in our working group is that uh, we actually find that tenants call 311 when the, um, the uh, water is out or ga cooking gas is out or something like that and then that can lead to um, an, uh, um, a vacate order in which case people are um, hooked up to housing through the American Red Cross and ultimately uh, move into other permanent affordable ho or permanent housing. Um, for the um, uh, in the situation I mentioned in my first answer in some cases owners are also calling on on tenants. Um, and so we have this very unique situation where we literally need to learn more about what is going on in this, um, in this population and in this housing stock in order for us to potentially scale up to a citywide program. Um, one of the concerns of the program that I think we've controlled for um, pretty well is the um, instance where somebody isn't able to go through with the entire program, um, and also where um, uh, people don't have necessarily a resource to go to uh, financially or on the technical assistance side. 
We've done this by um, working to procure a community-based organization who will be able to work more closely with homeowners than HVD would otherwise. So I just want to, again, uh, uh, be careful because anecdotally for me, the homeowners who I see and tenants who I see are in this uh, situation are largely from my community and even from Raphael's community are immigrants and their uh, extended family members who are staying there and who would have difficulty finding housing any other way because of immigration status, because of uh, uh, a whole bunch of different things. So again, you know, I, I'm cautiously optimistic, but I say be careful because uh, some of them don't fit the criteria and they're there, you know, as, uh, as a necessity, not as a luxury. Uh, both from the homeowner's perspective and the tenant perspective. Right. Thank and, you. And I, and I agree with that, and I think that that's why we also are approaching it in this way. To, we should all be looking towards the outcome of this work as the evaluation so we can understand all those factors to make sure that we're controlling for unintended consequences but taking advantage of any opportunities introduced as well. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Chair Cornegie. You've asked all the great questions. So um, I'm just going to ask a few just for clarification, just in case any of my constituents are watching. Um, now, I mentioned, I, I've heard you mention earlier that every bedroom has to have a window in order for um, residents to be able to escape in case there is an emergency. Yes, sir, that's correct. So does this mean that uh, attached row homes will not be included as part of the program? Uh, they might be able to comply with either rear yard or front yard windows. Okay, so they would be able to comply under those scenarios. Yes. All right, so currently, uh, who is the program tailored to? If you're a homeowner, how would you be able to uh, access this loan? Um, so the legislation would be open to any homeowner in Community District 5. The financing program, um, we have some additional eligibility criteria. So it's specifically designed for lower income homeowners um, to address some of the barriers on the financial side to undertaking the improvements. Um, uh, we'll be working the public engagement unit um, and uh, the community-based organization that will be administering the program will be doing uh, very targeted outreach to potentially eligible homeowners within the district. Um, to gauge interest, do a little education and also gauge interest. Um, the homeowners that are interested, we will then, uh, the community-based organization will go back out and do an initial home assessment to determine whether the property is eligible um, and whether or not the, the physical modifications are feasible. If they are, then um, they could be selected to participate in the pilot program. Now, is rental income being um, considered as overall gross income when you decide on who qualifies as a low-income homeowner? So, um, rental income is accounted for in the household income calculation. Okay. Um, if, if a homeowner in, in District 5 does not want to participate in the loan program, will they still be able to follow the criteria and legalize their basement uh, with their own private dollars? Sure, so the legislation applies to any homeowner within the community district. So even if a homeowner doesn't need the financing, doesn't want the financial assistance, the technical support that we'll be providing, they could still take advantage of the, um, the code changes. Any rules around residency for the homeowner? So uh, for the financing program, it's uh, the applicant has to uh, live in their home so they have to, it has to be an owner occupant. Um, but the legislation more generally, uh, again, it's open to any homeowner. Okay. Uh, has, have, do you have any numbers of how, how many homeowners in, in CB5 would qualify for the program under the current um, regulations? Yes, one second. Uh, this is Chris Holm from the Department of City Planning. Uh, we estimate that there are about uh, 8,000 properties that are potentially eligible for the program. Okay. 
so then, um, I, council member, I'm sorry, can I add just on the on the financing side, you know, this has been designed in a way that gives different terms based on income. And so we've allowed for basically almost all homeowners in the in the area, regardless of their income, to have a financing product available to them, but it varies based on their their income. And and if a homeowner taps into that financing, they would have to keep the basement apartment affordable, correct? Yes, so um, our goal, as we mentioned in the testimony, is to try to balance the needs of the homeowner with also trying to create protections for the resident. Um, if the property is occupied today, if the unit or the, the basement or cellar is occupied today, um, we, the community-based organization, will be working with the existing resident to relocate if necessary during construction, and they'll have an option to return. Um, there will also be some affordability protections put in place to create predictability for the homeowner in terms of the revenue that they can expect to come in, but also to create some predictability for the rent or household um, so that they are not subject to significant market changes. So earlier I, I've heard mention that uh, having a gas, appli gas appliances in the basements can lead to the, vaca the, the vacating of a, of a basement unit, correct? Did I hear that correctly earlier? Uh, there are uh, there there are certain provisions that just can be that there are many provisions that can lead to a vacate, and so one of them might be might be that yes. Okay. So does the bill speak speak to what sort of appliances would be allowed in the basement when legalizing the the, the unit? It's not specifically, uh, it doesn't specifically call out appliances. I think the issue you're, you're referring to is um, being near gas-fired heating equipment, which normally is prohibited from being within sleeping rooms. Uh, and the bill does require a fire-rated separation and ventilation for the equipment itself. Okay, great. Those are my questions for now. Thank you. But before, before I, I and then pass it over to Brad, I just want to stress the importance of this program especially for the homeowners in my district who are low income, whose home is the only source of wealth they have, and be able to build that wealth and pass it on to generations and their families. And anything we do, I want to make sure that doesn't put the homeowner at jeopardy, uh, losing their homes because of the fact that they somehow couldn't um, follow certain regulations in place or ha had trouble selling their home down the line because of, because of uh, some of the, the specifications that, that the loan or anything else might require of them. We have to be very sensitive to the fact that this is the only source of wealth for many families in our districts and we need to be, make sure that they have, also have the same protections as, as the tenants living in the basement as well. I understand, thanks. So before I pass it uh, to the bill sponsor, I just want to just um, uh, piggyback off of what Raphael said, I'm sorry, Council Member Espinal said, <laughs> which is, um, so as we're getting ready to pass this bill, there are unscrupulous contractors who are coming up with lending instruments that uh, uh, don't meet the standard, I'm sure, that the city is, is setting as it relates to lending. We actually have bills in the city council to go after these uh, unscrupulous contractors who aren't finishing work and attaching liens to people's homes and all of that. So I just want to, I just want to flag for you uh, the ability that in this, so they're counting this and probably watching the hearing right now uh, and getting their lending instruments ready to be able to go in and, and pitch some homeowners, whether it's in their own language, whether it's whatever, in an attempt not to, not to do what's in the best interest of either those landlords. And I don't want to come back next year and have another hearing on whether or not we were able to be mindful of the unscrupulous behavior that takes place around $11 million or whatever um, um, the ultimate um, uh, number will be that the cost is associated with. So I just want to, that's not in the bill, but I want to make sure that I can flag for you the opportunity for unscrupulous behavior as it relates to not, um, not, not lending sources per se, but unscrupulous contractors that we're dealing with at the council right now to, to remedy. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we, just two, um, two things to note with regard to the program. I think first, right, the, 
having a demonstration program for a limited amount of time, I think really gives us the opportunity to look at what is working, um, whether we've addressed the barriers and addressed the feasibility questions, but also what the potential unintended, unintended consequences are and how we can um, address those if we're looking at a, a wider program. So the evaluation aspect of this program I think is very critical. I think um, second, um, for the financing program specifically, I think one of the great advantages of the structure we've set up and having a community-based organization oversee it, um, they're gonna be working directly with the homeowners to make sure that the contractors are, you know, are doing what they need to be doing. They'll be monitoring construction along the way and reporting back to us. Um, so I think we have some nice um, structure set up to make sure that that very thing doesn't happen. Thank you. Councilman Melinda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this actually wasn't where I was going to start in my questions, but I'm going to follow up on yours because it flags something I want to just make sure we're thinking about because it seems to me that the potential for um, unscrupulous lending might exist not in the subsidy program, but in the possibility that people are allowed to avail themselves of the modified housing code outside of the subsidy program. And so I want to kind of ask how we're thinking about that for a minute, which I hadn't thought about before. So you answered, you know, um, to Council Member Espinal's question that, uh, you know, any homeowner in Community Board 5 could seek to avail themselves under the modified housing code we're passing here. And I guess our, our thought in general is that for the most part, because it's expensive work, um, that people generally aren't going to do it at scale outside of the subsidy program. They've got the right, they're, you know, they will take their applications at the buildings department, but for the most part, it's pretty expensive work and our gut is most people who participate in the program will do so through the HPD subsidy. Is that right? That's accurate. So I wonder, I'm just mindful of, of um, Chair Cornegie's issue, you know, you could imagine um, somewhat unscrupulous lenders or investors coming in and offering people some instrument with which they could pay to do this work. And I wonder whether, well, I guess a couple of questions. Um, how it'll be flagged at DOB if someone comes in who's outside of the HPD program seeking you know, to avail themselves of this code, and whether there might be a role for the contracted nonprofit um, to like, have some role in talking even to those applicants so that if, for example, you have a homeowner that, you know, uh, some unscrupulous lender comes along and says, hey, here's $150,000 real cheap, um, that'll pay for you. We got a contractor right here. They'll upgrade your unit, see this great new code. Don't pay too much attention to the small print. We'll take you to the buildings department. We'll get the work done, and lo and behold. So I wonder, because we have the contracted nonprofit, maybe there would be some way of having them involved, at least being aware of situations, even where the subsidy's not applied, um, or some way to make sure, both that we're capturing the information for data and research purposes, but also maybe providing a little bit of protection against that. So we will certainly, um, because the applications will need to go through DOB, so we'll certainly know um, who is applying, um, regardless of whether or not they're participating in the financing program. And I, I'm certainly willing to think about a way that we could reach out to those applicants and understand more about the specific situation. That's great. And I, this was, I, we, we've talked about this program a lot, and I haven't raised this question before because until the chair brought this issue up, I really hadn't thought about it. So I, um, um, but I think that would be helpful. Um, and it, it may be that there are indeed zero applications outside the subsidy program, or it may be that, you know, there are some folks who are able to avail themselves of it with their own savings and resources, um, but at least being mindful to the risk um, is worth doing, and if we can think together about yeah, how to do that. I think we will, and we're mindful of it, um, and it's absolutely baked into our evaluation to understand what the implications of that could be. Okay. Um, all right, now I want to take a big step back uh, and ask about the broader data and how we think about this universe of buildings, owners, tenants. Um, it's hard to do because we don't have good information. I, you know, the, the number that we use comes from this very clever, uh, anal or at least the number that I use, and I know Chai as well, comes from this very clever analysis that Citizens Housing and Planning Council did many years ago where they compared census data against C of O grantings to try to 
find those places where it seemed like there was population gr household growth without unit growth. Um, and you obviously uh, have and, and are citing the complaint data, enforcement data um, on uh, illegal units. But I just wonder if you could say a little more. You mentioned this 8,000 number that's just a community district five number. What do we know at sort of scale about these units, occupied, unoccupied, and are we trying to do some things to make sure that the, in addition to all we learn from this pilot program and the outreach and these 40 households, that's nestled in with the kind of macro analysis that understands the units at scale? Sure, so um, as you mentioned, this has been you know, people have made estimates, people have tried to um, put fancy algorithms together, we've done it. Um, <laughs> and, you know, until you actually do this demonstration program, until you can introduce hard facts and, um, and knowledge to the conversation, um, we will just continue to do that. That being said, there's good value in that work. Um, Citizens Housing Planning Council has uh, did a report in the last couple of years, actually, um, uh, Hidden Housing, where they did a, a similar analysis, uh, taking into account, uh, using Pluto data, um, the potential population of uh, housing stock that could be added just through this um, type of work. And what they concluded was that it was a range of 10 to 38,000 units. And the range exists um, M namely because of some uh, nuance to the last filter of criteria. Um, but their point was basically, even if you do a lot of criteria and even if you layer on a, a lot of things, we still think at a minimum there's 10,000 units that could be added to the stock. Um, and that's a lot of housing. And so, and then when you think about where that is, there are specific geographies um, where this would be able to add significant uh, housing. Um, and if it were to scale up citywide, would just generally be more affordable housing. Um, and so in terms of where the complaints data are and where the violations are, it's largely areas where there's an intersection of the, of the zoning for that type of housing and generally lower income uh, homeowners, because it's in a, a position they're in. Um, but, you know, that, that's why we're doing this demonstration program to in, in order to introduce uh, those facts and in order to introduce that information. But this would not be a kind of a, um, uh, uh, an effort that wouldn't somehow lead to more housing, we think, if it were to be scaled up citywide. Um, and even CHBC will say that's a somewhat conservative analysis, um, and so the, there could be actually more sources of housing um, across the city as well. And I know one other uh, analytic process the city's had in recent years is that there was a restructuring of how to do enforcement. This is now in the prior administration, but there was an effort to kind of be thoughtful about, you know, not just having enforcement be driven by where the 311 calls were, were calling. And I know the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics did some work to try to figure out how to think about where there really was, was risk. Is that, I've, I've lost track of that. It was like five years ago. Is that still, going um, on and has that informed this effort? Uh, I can't speak for, for Moda's work. Um, I can say generally there, as, as you know, we partnered on the Certification of No Harassment um, Task Force and did a data-driven analysis on where uh, harassment was more likely to um, take place to inform the, uh, that program. Um, there have been various analyses over the years on targeting specific types of buildings for different reasons, risk of displacement, a loss of rent regulation units. Um, however, I don't actually know of an analysis um, that, that is targeting proactively on homeowners, and nor do I think that that would be the case uh, for this population. Um, this population is unique. Uh, homeowners generally do not have the same resources as private landlords in um, multiple dwellings. Uh, they generally have a harder time navigating the city's uh, housing programs available to them, and we've made great effort, especially under Kim's leadership, to allow them to do that, and we're building on that through this program, too. Um, but we are not proactively 
enforcing or investigating against homeowners. Um, it's largely a, uh, a 311 driven system in this particular uh, population. In other programs and in other cases, we are taking more proactive efforts, um, especially in the rent regulated stock. Okay. Um, and then I want to, uh, well, I guess one last question on the data, and, and maybe we don't, this is just a, you know, an area we don't know, and that's why we're doing the program. But in terms of thinking about to what extent the units we're talking about are um, occupied or, or not yet occupied, um, you talked about there being 8,000 eligible properties. Do, do we have any sense of sort of what percent of the properties that we think are eligible already have units, and do we have any expectations just built into the subsidy model about what the mix will be of places where there is a tenant currently in occupancy versus where it's vacant or not yet a unit? Sure. So we don't have we don't have an estimate of that. Um, we haven't made one because we want to look to the demonstration program in order to understand that. We expect that through initial outreach and initial findings, we'll learn more about what that percent is, and, and I think we should, we should talk about that and, and what that means. But as of right now, we're creating a path for homeowners um, to even approach this program um, without having the risk of you know, having a vacate order uh, put on them by, by partnering with the community-based organization who will be very much the face-to-face -face interaction with homeowners who can speak to them, mention you know specific uh, things they might be nervous about working with the city or excited about whatever it may be. Um, but that being said, you know we'll find that through the demonstration program, um, and it's one of the things we're actually most curious about. Okay. All right, and then my last area of questions is about um, the question of tenant protections, which we've spoken about offline a number of times, and I really want to reinforce what Councilmember Espinal said. Obviously, we are. In especially in this pilot program, looking at homeowners who, um, you know, in many cases are low income, we're talking about their one source of wealth, and we want to make sure protections are in place. We also have a very vulnerable tenant population wherever there are, you know, folks in occupancy. I think there's reason to believe that, you know, these are folks who couldn't find another affordable housing option, don't have a lease, in many cases are undocumented, um, are certainly low income and at risk tenants. So. We want to structure this program to not lead to their eviction, displacement, and homelessness, and I know you share that goal as well. Um, there's some challenges in doing that, and I guess I just think, while we haven't, I know, worked out every detail of this, that it would be useful to just shed a little light on how we're thinking about it. Obviously, these are not rent-regulated units, so protections have to exist outside of our normal rent regulation system. Um, there's the challenges of having people have to move out if there's construction work done and come back, and what kind of lease, some of the issues that homeowners will face in their trajectory, but I think if you could just talk a little more about the principles you're using and what you're thinking about to make sure we provide um, tenant protections, especially where there's a tenant in occupancy at the beginning of the program, we surely want our program to do no harm to that household. Sure, we absolutely agree. I think, um, you know, we've been fortunate to be able to draw upon some of the experience we have in our other preservation programs at HPD for how we um, would work to protect tenants in place. So, um, you know, our general approach in our preservation programs is during the a renovation project that uh, the tenant uh, is relocated temporarily. Um, we prioritize or try to work to the extent possible to keep folks in their community where they have social networks and where their children go to school or whatever else. Um, and then they have an option to return at the end. Um, and you know, these, the, the residents here, uh, presumably some of them don't have leases, um, but they would get a lease. Um, that lease um, at a minimum, and we're still working through the details here and with your office as well as some of, um, uh, Councilmember Espinal's office and some of the advocates that have been involved in this initiative, but at a minimum, um, that lease would provide with predictable rent increases um, and would allow the resident to have a renewal at the end of the term. So some of the benefits that a resident uh, within a rent-stabilized unit would get, they will get. Um, 
so those are some of the, the primary things that we're looking at here. And I think, you know, the, the challenge is that we haven't um, worked to create these types of protections within this type of stock. Um, for our existing uh, home ownership programs, most of them don't have kind of any restrictions on the rental units. And so I think as we move through the process, we're gonna have to, um, we're gonna hopefully have a feedback loop to understand what's working for the homeowners and how to make sure that we're best protecting the residents. Yeah, and I think it's just worth underlining this. This is a new challenge because mostly in our preservation programs, we're talking about, you know, rental, maybe larger buildings. And so our focus is on tenant protections and the affordability for tenants. Mostly in our home ownership programs, we're talking about focusing on creating affordable home ownership and we have vacant units. And so we can worry a little less about how they'll deploy those. We don't have much of this situation where we want to support homeowners, but where we also have in place low income tenants. And so that's going to be a balance. And, you know, I think we'll keep working together to make sure. And I appreciate the work you've done so far. And we're just going to have to keep an eye on it. In, a, in a, an interesting way, you know, for it's easier, as hard as it's going to be to do in the subsidized space, if this does scale, we're going to have the real challenge of how to think about it outside of the subsidized units where we don't have today the tools for tenant protection um, much in evidence so fortunately I'm up you know I think it's reasonable as I said at the beginning to expect that the vast majority of folks taking advantage of this in the pilot will be going through the subsidy program so we can work out the tenant protections and provide them but I'll just flag for what I hope will be the long term when we can expand this program beyond we're going to need to think creatively about how to provide tenant protections where people are not availing themselves to the subsidies as well. So thank you very much for all the thoughtfulness you've put in the program so far. I look really forward to working with the chair and with Councilmember Espinal and with you to finalize the details of the legislation and see the program get started. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Grudenchik, I'm sorry. Thank you, Chair. Cornegy, thank you for being here today. I think it's still morning, right? Yes. Um, I wanted to pick up on um, one of the line of questions that my colleague, uh, Councilman Lander, had. It, it, did you say or did, uh, I don't know if you said it or if you said it, the, the number of illegal, currently illegal basement apartments in New York City, do we have a fix on this? And so, uh, we, the city doesn't have a formal estimate of it. However, what we had we all said it. Um, Chaya uh, Community Development Corporation has uh, a report done where they estimated about 100,000 informal housing units, uh, a most of which is expected to be basement uh, or cellar occupancy. I mean, given the census data that we received last time in my home borough of Queens, um, w which was ridiculous, I thought. Um, from 2000 to 2010, they had an increase of 1,343 people in the entire borough, which is just laughable. There were there were more people on certain blocks in Flushing moving in. So it is hard um, to come up with a true number, but I would, would say that given anecdotal evidence that I received from my principals, which is fine, um, that the number is enormous. Um, you had mentioned, or someone had mentioned, rent stabilization. Do you anticipate these units, if we pass this law and we establish this pilot program, do you, will they be rent stabilized, or how is that going to work? So the, um, the legislation itself does not require it. Uh, for the owners that participate in the pilot uh, financing program, there will be uh, protections for any existing residents. By protections, do you mean rent stabilization or? No. Okay. So. No. So the they are they're kind of aspects of the some of the some of the aspects of rent stabilization will exist, but not rent stabilization itself. So, for example, um, tenants will be given a lease that has predictable rent increases. Um, will they be guaranteed a new lease or? They will. So tenants that have to relocate during construction will have an option to return and they will be given a lease, and that lease will um, allow, will allow the, the owner to charge a certain amount annually that will be known to both the homeowner and to the um, resident to create the predictability on both sides. Um, they will also have an option to renew the lease. So those are two of the aspects of 
uh, some of the benefits of a rent stabilized lease that would exist here, but the units themselves will not be rent stabilized. Um, do we have an estimate on what the average basement apartment is going to cost to upgrade? Have, have you worked that out with DOB or thought that through? Sure. Here you want to. Okay. Um, so we, the the initial estimates, and this is estimates because we haven't really done this before, but we expect, um, based on the current code, the cost would be, uh, would range from about $160,000 uh, to $260,000. Um, the code changes outlined in the legislation are expected to result in savings of approximately 30 to 40%. Um, so the cost goes down pretty dramatically in relation to the, the changes. Here. And are these going to, the people that participate in the pile, are they going to get loans or are they going to get grants or how's that going to work? So um, the, the owners that participate in the pilot financing program will be eligible for loans. Those are low interest or no interest loans. Uh, the exact terms will be based on uh, a number of factors, including um, homeowner household income, their credit history, some other factors as well. Um, and they will, so there'll be loans and they'll be repayable. And uh, my council's understanding is that um, even if we didn't, even if this just was a pilot and was never expanded, um, that this would be permanent at least in this community board. Is that correct? Because to ask people to undo this and to put them on the hook for up to $260,000 doesn't seem like a good idea to me. So I'm assuming, but I'd like to hear your answer, that, that this would be, these people would be um, set aside if the pilot program was as far as we ever got. So the legislation allows for homeowners in Community District 5 to submit to DOB constr construction documents to DOB within 18 months. And if they do so, um, they, and they complete the work, they would get then a new CFO or a modified CFO, basically that shows that these units are legal units. So it will be a permanent change with regard to that residence. And does DOB anticipate an inspection before construction? or just after construction or both? Do you, have you thought about how that's gonna happen? Because we've had a situation in one of my co-ops, we have tightened obviously um, the gas laws in the past year or so, and that's creating um, a lot of interesting issues for people living in my part of the world, uh, where they're now scrambling to update and legalize things that they didn't know was illegal. So my question is, will people be fined for illegal Apartments, if they step forward, are they going to get uh, some kind of um, asylum, so to speak, uh, or some kind of waiver of those fines? Have you thought about that? So, do you want to uh, sure. So there's really uh, there's the legislation here, and then there's the program. Um, and so in terms of people coming through the program, um, what we've done is we've uh, worked to uh, set up a relationship with a community-based organization who's going to be the face-to-face -face interaction with the, the homeowner. Um, and so in the case that a homeowner um, has something out of compliance with the law but still wants to participate in the program, they'll be able to- It's almost certain that they're going to have something out of compliance with the law if they're stepping forward to you know, create a basement apartment. I, would assume that some of them to this point haven't, but I would assume that most people that are stepping forward, I may be wrong, but I would assume that a good percentage of the people step forward, stepping forward to participating in this pilot program um, would currently have a, uh, a, a domicile in their basement that is not obviously not legal. So my, my question and my concern for these folks is would they be opening themselves up to massive fines um, is there a provision for you to waive those fines? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm so, seeing a lot of shaking the heads, but I... Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Do you wanna... okay. There is a provision in the legislation to defer any existing violations and civil penalties till the that would otherwise hold up the issuance of a permit as part of this program 
till the uh, completion of this program, uh, with the exception of uh, immediately hazardous violations and violations in the uh, in the actual space being altered in the the underground space, where those violations have to be uh, uh, corrected, but the the penalties themselves are deferred till the. So if it. If there is an immediately hazardous condition, they could be fined for that, though. No, the no, the, no fines here, or or the, the put in abeyance until such time. Correct. All right. Um, uh, Councilmember, I feel I feel bad that I didn't use my grandmother's analogy well enough to clear this up. I said fattening frogs for snakes. I uh, I have never heard that term before, <laughs> but as the chair of the Parks Committee, I am <laughs> concerned about our frogs and our snakes. <laughs> Um, frogs are often a bellwether of how good, how well the environment is doing. Um, but I, I do appreciate your grandmother's wisdom, certainly. Um, uh, I am going to, um, I think that is it for now, but I just want to check through my notes. I know Councilman Jonah is probably very eager, um, to ask questions. Um, so the, the last question, just so I understand, and I, I think this was answered. So if this just ends after several years, um, there'll be a new mayor in three years, there'll be a lot of new council members in three years, and if the pilot program doesn't get expanded, these people will be, I guess, just grandfathered into the system. So they'll have a different, like you said, a different CFO? Yeah, right, there, there's a, di well, on the CEO side, I'll, I'll let us speak to that, but there's gonna be a separate agreement with the homeowners through through the HPD program, but the code side, I'll let Gus speak to. Yes, the uh, the legislation makes allowances for an amended CFO to be issued, recognizing the occupancy of this space per this particular local law. So, and that will live on. That live on forever. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for, for your answers this morning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Councilmember Barron, who also is one of the co-sponsors of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the committee for coming and uh, sharing your thoughts on this. I hope I don't ask questions that you've already answered. If so, you can let me know or give me a short answer, because I see your answers have been very extensive. So you could either just let me know it's been answered and I'll check it, or give me a capsule version of your answer. Is this program only for homes that already have existing accommodations in their basements, or could it also include homeowners who don't yet have anything in their basements? So the legislation specifically authorizes changes to the code for existing one unit, uh, single family properties within uh, community district five, whether um, and if they have a cellar or basement, right. existing cellar or basement, regardless of whether or not it is occupied. Okay, I just wanted to be clear on that. Now, in your testimony, you're talking about uh, um, single homeowners, single family homes. Do you have objections to two family homes? And what are the implications of adding an apartment to the basement of a two family home? in terms of the tax class and things of that nature. Uh, the, the issue there is adding another dwelling unit to a two-family home would make it a three-family home and subject to the New York State multiple dwelling law, which is beyond our capability to amend. Okay. Now, you indicated that uh, you think the cost would be approximately one sixty to $260,000 in that range. And how much do you anticipate will be the um, assistance that homeowners will be able to get, either through a grant or a low interest loan? Sure. So um, we, the financing program that HPD is creating will provide loans of up to $120,000 um, for three and four unit, and I just want to clarify something um, that was just said. The, the legislation is for existing one unit properties or right. certain two unit properties. Um, the financing program will actually be open to existing one, two, or three unit properties. 
okay, to, to enable conversion of an existing cellar or basement. Um, for properties that are converting to a three or four uh, unit. So property. at the financing, and I just want to be clear, the financing will be available for one, two, and three family? Yes. What, do we, what does that mean for family, for the homes that presently in uh, the tax class that's not multiple dwelling unit? So if they add first. another unit. So what, tax class change is actually going from three to four. So class one is one to three family homes. It's confusing, but there are two things going on. One is for the property tax system, class one is one to three family, mm -hmm. and class two is uh, four or more. But the, for the uh, multiple dwelling law, it triggers at three units or more. So we call one and two unit homes private dwellings and three or more homes multiple dwellings. But they're not consistent between the tax law and the, the building law, um, but that's some clarification. Okay, and I had interrupted your answer. Sure, so um, the, there will be some additional funding available for uh, properties converting to three or four units in order to do critical repairs uh, in the rest of the home. Um, that would be on a, based on a kind of a needs assessment done by the community-based organization overseeing the program. Um, so it is possible, depending on the exact needs, uh, renovation needs, in order to facilitate the conversion, that uh, the funding could cover all of the costs, or it could be certainly possible that the cost would be in excess of the amount that the city could help fund, in which case the homeowner um, would need to fund some of the costs on their own, either through savings or through um, getting a, a loan from a, a bank. And what is the estimated cost for the entire project of 40 homes? Sure, so the, um, the city uh, has funded the program at $12 million, uh, which is to cover the cost of the direct loans for the homeowners, as well as the contract for the community-based organization uh, to provide technical and financial assistance to the homeowners in order to help get them through the entire uh, process. Uh, it also helps fund staff, uh, a small amount to fund staff at each of the relevant agencies. So in your testimony, you say, uh, with help from the CBOs, the owners will work directly with qualified contractors to renovate their basements in compliance with modified standards from the local law. What are we going to do to avoid having the situation that we face with Build It Back with families that have been promised by the city or we're going to make it better and families are looking at disasters. What are we going to do to make sure that we don't run into that same situation? Okay, so um, the community, two things. Um, what the outreach that we're doing, basically assuming the legislation is uh, approved, the next stage of the program would be outreach to homeowners. Um, and we have a very robust outreach plan that we worked on with the public engagement unit. Um, interested homeowners would then have a part two, which would be to do an initial home assessment. And from the initial home assessments, we'll be um, working to determine eligibility and feasibility of a modification. The 40 participants in the pilot program will be selected from that group of homeowners. Um, the CBO then will work with those homeowners to get a complete application um, and to help the homeowner um, identify an architect as well as a contractor um, to actually undertake the improvements. So the architect will work on the design, um, will be submitting on behalf of the owner to DOB. Um, the contractor would then uh, undertake the renovations once they're approved by DOB. And then the community-based organization will be overseeing the construction to make sure that uh, the contractor is um, complying with the design outlined in the plans. How, I, I, I appreciate that uh, process. I'm talking about the end result where we looked at homes where there was a disjoint of inches 
between areas uh, didn't, ma didn't mesh, didn't match, falling apart. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure these were contracts who's been qualified, certified. So are you saying that the CBO is going to make sure that these contractors perform uh, appropriately? And what if, in the end, we still have inappropriate work done? So the community-based organization will be overseeing the work of the contractor. So they'll be out on the site making sure things are going well. The contractors will not be paid for work that is not done appropriately. So it will be payment based on performance, um, which is the way that we, um, that HPD funds all of our renovation projects, where you have to actually complete the work successfully in order to be paid. And if after a period of six, eight months, a year, we notice, oh, the floors are sinking, they're not, is there a clawback measure? Is there an opportunity to recoup what we've given so that someone else can come and do the work appropriately? So depending on the work in question, there are warranties. We also, um, we also require that a certain amount of uh, retainage be held back from contractors until successful completion and a workmanship period generally. Um, but if there's specific issues that you're thinking about other than the settling floors, we're happy to take a look at it and see how we can address that within the program. The, there were, I believe your testimony said 8,000 families or homeowners who were identified. Who did you engage in doing that outreach? Because I don't think anyone called my office. So the, I mean, uh, Chris from DCP can probably speak about how we got to the 8,000 number, but um, we, just to speak briefly about the outreach, um, PEU did some very preliminary outreach within the community last summer. They reached out to about 420 homeowners um, to do kind of an initial survey to um, look at interest um, in uh, the conversion, uh, to also gauge feedback, response rate, um, to look at um, so the kind of big questions, m mostly around interest in moving forward if this was a pilot that actually were out there. Um, they did get a 90% response rate, and they did find from that outreach that about 30% of the homeowners that the, they were able to come at with were interested in the, um, the program and would be interested in um, discussing more should the program move forward. Um, the more robust outreach to the potentially 8,000 um, homeowners within Community District 5 won't, hasn't happened yet. Um, that outreach will happen um, over about 12 weeks once um, we see what happens with the legislation. Um, and that they will then do follow-up conversations with homeowners, same thing, gauge interest. If there's homeowners that are interested, then there will be um, the community-based organization will then reach out to those homeowners to do a more in-depth home assessment to determine eligibility and feasibility. So if you have questions about the 8,000, I could have DCP answer them, but uh, the, out, the more targeted outreach has not yet happened. Well, I certainly would expect that I would be contacted Absolutely. to be uh, an engaged partner and stakeholder doing the outreach, as well as my colleague, Councilmember Espinal. Absolutely. So we look forward to that. And lastly, how long, what's the time frame that you think it would take for a basement to be completed? So from the point in time of starting the renovation work yes. and toward completion, under a year. Say again? Under a year. Under a year. That's different from what I had heard previously at another session. I'm glad to know that it's under a year. And so in preparation for getting to uh, the construction phase, how much time would it take for the paperwork, the processing, and all of that? So I think it, so. there's the completion of the application from the point in time we have a complete application from a, a participating homeowner. Um, the next step is then for the architect to work with the homeowner 
to develop the plans to submit to the Department of Buildings. Mm -hmm. We have, uh, within the legislation, basically from the start until when construction documents need to be submitted to BOB, um, there is 18 months that's allowed um, for homeowners to do that. We are hoping that it doesn't take that long, but there is that much time outlined in the legislation if need be. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry, Councilman Mahim Deutsch. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, firstly, I just want to ask you: um, uh, Are these apartments uh, are they vacant or are they occupied? The ones in the pilot program, the first 400. So, so um, there's no requirement that they be vacant or occupied, um, and so that's part of the demonstration program is to determine. Um, how many of them might be occupied. So if an apartment's occupied and the uh, construction takes a year, where are those uh, tenants being relocated? Yeah, there's a, a relocation uh, program that's being set up as part of this, which Commissioner Darga can speak to more of. So the community-based organization will, um, once we have a complete, complete application and there's a plan submitted to DOB, we're about to close on the financing, though uh, any existing residents would be temporarily relocated, um, and they would then have an option to return upon completion of the renovations. Uh, what is the protection that if they want to return that uh, the homeowner will accept them back in? So that will be required as part of the, um, the program in order for them to get the financing. Okay. Um, how does one qualify for an apartment, and what is the process if uh, the apartment's vacant? So upon completion of the renovations, if the apartment yeah, is correct. vacant, so the community-based organization will be responsible for helping the homeowner select a qualified uh, resident to lease the unit. So it's up to the homeowner? Largely. Uh, what is the not largely part? Uh, they have to select a qualified homeowner so I mean uh, so what uh, qualifies one person so they have to somebody that can actually qualify in terms of um, making the rental payments regularly we have a kind of a targeted household income it's not going to be set in stone but basically we're looking for households that are earn under a hundred percent of area median income how many of those apartments that you identified in 8,000 are handy maybe handicapped accessible Uh, we don't have an estimate of that. So you have several thousand homeless seniors currently in the streets of New York City who um, don't have a place to live. Um, so are they going to be part of this program to see which apartments may be handicapped accessible for them to qualify? There, there's no requirement that they be, um, that homeowners have to rent to somebody who's homeless, um, but there are a number of homeless programs. But could, uh, that would that be like a choice to give a uh, homeowner, say, you know, we have a 85-year-old yes. uh, senior citizen who is, who's yeah. currently in a homeless shelter? Any voucher-based system, a homeowner will be able to know about and be able to potentially use, and that includes housing choice vouchers and includes city vouchers as well. Uh -huh. So the um, uh, veterans would be offered that um, uh, would veterans and seniors um, be a top priority to the homeowner? That is that going to be offered to a homeowner, or just you're going to tell the homeowner, okay, just whoever you're getting, just they have to fit the criteria. S to be clear, right, the community-based organization will be advertising the units. They're, these are not going to go through the full Housing Connect process that we have for other units, but there will be similar eligibility and advertising um, requirements the community-based organization will follow. These will not be set aside as um, homeless units per se, where we would have referrals coming from the shelter system. Is the community-based organization here today? Um, I think there are probably members of the organization here. Uh -huh. um, earlier, so, how many of those 8,000 um, uh, potential uh, homes in the pilot program, how many of those may be in foreclosure where this extra income may make it or break it for that homeowner? Um, we don't know the exact number, but we do know that this community district um, owners are much more likely to be 
burdened. Uh, there's much a higher rate of foreclosures. It's the fourth highest rate of list pendants filings in the city. Um, so generally, it's a absent of the program. It's a it's a risky area in terms of um, mortgage delinquency. So in other words, from the 8,000, you may have zero who's potentially in foreclosure that this may help um, the income. Um, well, a home that's in foreclosure is a very complicated situation um, and you know that we are building foreclosure counseling actually into the um, contract with the community-based organization to the extent that somebody is in default or is looking for um, counseling and uh, resources on what, resor what other resources might be available, that's built into the program as well. So they have a chance to understand the implications of default, what their lender might think, things like that. So it's complicated for us, but you know how complicated it may be for someone who may lose their home. Um, so I, I'm just looking at this whole um, pilot program, and I'm just gonna put in my two cents that I think we need to zero in and get to the root of um, uh, the homeless problem in our city and also the foreclosure issue that many people are losing homes. It may be difficult for us to um, look at a home and bring them the resources that an individual may need in order to get them out of a foreclosure situation. But I think when we're looking at this um, program, we need to do that extra work and make sure that people that are in foreclosure are part of this program because of this extra income will make it for them, uh, for them to succeed and, and uh, save their home. We need to focus on that. We also need to focus on our um, few thousand seniors who are, in, who are in homeless shelters. It could be any of our parents or, or grandparents who is at a homeless shelter and we need to zero in on our seniors, making sure that they have an apartment and also checking to see which, which, which homes are handicapped accessible. And when we rely on a non-for-profit to do the outreach without them being here today and discussing what the process is, um, then this is, um, you know, I don't think we're accomplishing too much except saying, okay, we're having this pilot program uh, in a certain community board district, and that's it. Um, it's, it's, this is a, a step in the right direction, but we need to do a lot more work in order to get the people the help they need, the people that have no voice, the people that are losing their homes, the people that are in homeless shelters or are, are in the streets. Um, so we need to do that extra heavy work by working together and making sure that we get and we work from bottom up. Yeah, and um, so I agree. I think we've taken a lot of caution in approaching this program um, for those reasons. Um, I, there I are know Councilmember Inez Barron um, didn't have a conversation with anyone. She was like kind of um, like, like who do you well, speak with? If I, but, if I can but, just. But a council member who, who has this pilot program in her district, there should have been discussions with her. Well, so a couple of things. One is we have spoken to Councilmember Barron about the general program, um, but what we're talking about is we're actually in negotiations right now with the community-based organization, and these are all provisions we're building into the contract. So it would not be appropriate for us to ask the community-based organization to testify on an outreach plan that doesn't exactly, isn't finalized yet, but will be uh, soon. This legislation is what's critical to be, we need this legislation in order to go with the, forward with the program because the barriers that homeowners face currently under the current code provisions are too high. Um, and as a result, there's, no, there's a, a remedy that we would like to put in place or see one day, which is to add legal, safe, affordable housing. And this is another program in addition to a multitude of programs that are designed to do that. And so we're looking to overcome those barriers in the long term. How that intersects with other programs, we're really mindful of. So how can we use vouchers? How can we use um, city, uh, the city shelter system and the vouchers that uh, residents come out with? Um, you know, to the extent that we can, then we'll do that. Um, but those are all the things that we're keeping in mind as we design this program.
So will there be a briefing uh, to the members um, with the non-for-profit, and this way uh, they receive the input from my colleagues? I think that, yes, yeah, so we can. Before it gets rolled out? Bef well, we can. Before the final decision is made? Well, once we finalize the contract with the community-based organization, um, we will reach out to the, the, um, the council and we can discuss having a briefing or a, a full design of the program, yes. And um, those, those available apartments, are those for anyone in the city or just within those community boards? Uh, those would be available to anyone in the city, yes. So, um, so this pilot program is within a community board, right? One community board? Yes, it's in Community District 5. Um, so if it's available for, if it's, if it's available for an Italian city, why, why, I'm just curious, why isn't it spread out in different well, parts of the city? We can't prohibit um, people from around the city to move to a specific area for fair housing law reasons. No, so, so why isn't the apartments from the 8,000 potential um, apartments on this, uh, uh, homeowners on this pilot program, why aren't they scattered around in like different parts of the city? Um, so we, we talked about why this area in particular is the demonstration uh, program earlier. Um, there are a number of reasons. Um, one is this is a commitment we made through the East New York rezoning process. It's reflected in the tracker. But in addition to that, there, between the housing stock, the population um, that lives in this uh, community district, uh, we think it's a, it's a really ideal area to have the uh, demonstration program begin. Uh, the reason what, really I, is that we need to do a demonstration program and approach this issue because we also discussed that this has really been a 90-year debate in the city about what to do um, with uh, subterranean housing, basement and cellar housing, um, and how can we approach it in a way that we're creating legal, safe, affordable housing and balancing the interests of homeowners and tenants. And it is complicated. Um, because you're balancing four or five different codes with um, different uh, individual household situations on the homeowner side and the tenant side. So that's why we're doing a demonstration program, targeting it to an area so we can do the learning we need in order to uh, expand it citywide should that be appropriate. So I still don't understand um, why it's like in one area. I still don't understand the, the reason you gave me. Because if it's for housing purposes, then what's the difference um, which area the pilot program is, is being done in? And it's the, we're targeting this area because of the reasons I just outlined. It's better to do it in an area where we have one community-based organization that we can procure um, that has a relationship with the neighborhood, with residents. Uh, there's kind of a, a controlled aspect of that that leads to a very tight pilot period, when in this case three years, where doing it citywide would actually be um, impossible and would be too watered down um, by you know, not having enough representation from a certain area or, or whatever the case may be. By doing it in one area where we can have one organization partnering with other nonprofits, but one organization uh, with a diverse housing stock where there's an absolutely absolute need and also support from the uh, council member and the community through the re rezoning commitments. Um, it's, that's the reason this is the area. I still don't understand the reason, but whatever. Um, uh, to me, if it's a housing stock, you, ha you find housing stock all across the city, and if you need more non-community-based um, organizations. I work with Jericho with veterans, and they have, um, uh, they, have, they have housing all across the city, and mm -hmm. they're doing a great job on that. So, and if it's because people in that community may need housing more than other areas, then they have a right to live wherever they want, anywhere in the city. Well, um, can I, I, I just don't get it, but whatever. Okay, I'm not going to take up too much time. Well, I just would like to add one thing, which is this is a very, very small part of HPD's work and HPD's housing plan. We're building and preserving affordable housing across the city. Um, and so the reason it's this area is because it is a demonstration program, and it's designed to understand what are the... Uh, is the bill specifically um, in the bill? It's for this area? Yes. It is. Okay. Uh, all right. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Councilmember Deutsch. And to be clear, my question about my not being involved was not about general discussions and looking forward and shaping. My specific question was about not being involved in the outreach portion. So just to be clear, to keep that on the record. I will now have Council Member Jonai. He has questions. Thank you, Chair. Um, in theory, this sounds like a worthwhile project. My first question is to the Chair, since this is in your community board. What is the average median price for a home in that community, community board five, a one family home roughly? Would you like to answer? Um, it'd be I, interesting, I don't know the exact It would be number. interesting because I want to know if you have a good understanding of what my community is. Sure. So the, the average sales price of a one-family home in CD5, I don't have in front of me. Um, we can pull it. Um, it's generally um, on the, in the landscape of the entire city uh, in the, on the lower side of sales prices. Which would be about four to six hundred thousand, I'm guessing. Yes. I okay. Would. Great. Thank you. That's quite. <laughs> when we, we um, look to spend taxpayer dollars, it should be done wisely. Eleven million dollars for fifty homes at an average of approximately two hundred twenty thousand dollars a unit is a tremendous dollar amount for a single apartment. And I don't even know how far you've looked into the loan to value ratios, if there's an existing mortgage, what is the, what will be the interest rate of this loan? Because it's going to be a, solely a loan, correct? There's no, get, there's no grant into this formula? So the loans will have an interest rate of zero to 5%, depending on other, a number of factors. Zero to five. That's zero a huge five. spread. Mm -hmm. Because the, and just taking a step back, right, the, the financing is trying to achieve barriers to actually undertaking the improvements um, for lower income homeowners. And so without the financial support, coming up with $160,000, $120,000 is a pretty significant barrier. The private lending market um, generally, there are substantial restrictions in the ability of lower income homeowners to actually get the financing they need within the private market to do this type of work and to get the types of financing necessary. So the financing program that we're creating is really about trying to support lower income homeowners to address those financial barriers to undertake the improvements. But a lower income homeowner mm -hmm. by putting on this additional debt that they would have to repay because it's entirely a debt, correct? There's no giveaway? There's, there's, there's forgivable or repayable loans. See, now we get into the thick of the weeds. Mm -hmm. So it's forgivable or payable. Mm -hmm. Who makes the decision? So there are the, we have a financing program term sheet that the CBO will be responsible for following. It has the financial parameters for the program. Um, the terms that a, a particular homeowner are eligible for depends on a number of factors, including their household income. Lower income households are eligible for more, fi more favorable financing terms. Slightly higher income households who have more access to options within the private lending market have uh, terms that are, um, are more comparable to within the, the private market because the intent here again is to, re to reduce barriers for those that have the fewest options within the private market. Um, it also takes into account the age, so seniors have slightly more favorable options available that, to them. Um, it also accounts for credit history and debt to income because those are factors that the private lending market takes into account and where, for example, somebody that has a credit score of you know, 600 is basically not gonna qualify for any financing or has a debt to income ratio of 
46% is not going to qualify for private financing. But isn't that the target that we're looking to help those that couldn't afford to right. get a conventional So loan? rather than making those eligibility criteria, what we've done is structure a financing program so that those things are taken into account and setting the um, financing terms with the goal of creating an affordable product for the applicant homeowner. Which will be self-sustainable if they have to pay. So the debt to ratio value, if your home is over leveraged now, I would imagine they would not qualify? No, the, so the debt to income, the credit history are not no, no. eligibility debt, criteria. No, no, the loan to value. So mm -hmm. based on the value of the home, the current debt mm -hmm. through a conventional mortgage, this being an extra mortgage or a loan on the property mm -hmm. would create an environment where the property owner, it's not self-sustaining. So to be clear, we, we do not have the same constraints that a private lender has in making a loan. So we are using a loan authority that has certain requirements. Loan to value is not one of the Gee. limitations. However, let's, let's move on to our next one because I can see already that well, if we like haven't to, given this I'd thought. like to finish that, that question yeah. because the improvement to create a legal apartment will improve the value of the property for the homeowner and therefore make the loan supportable. Um, and as I mentioned, the loan will either amortize over the term of the loan, right, which an affordable be, interest rate. Which could be what? 15 years up to 30 years. Mm -hmm. And again, the term will be set in order to create an affordable product for that homeowner. So we're going to look at household income, household expenses, make sure there's sufficient cash to pay the bills, and set an interest rate so that that homeowner can actually repay the loan. Um, for lower income homeowners, there is an option for a forgivable loan over 15 years. They have to remain in compliance with loan terms, otherwise they would have to repay it. I don't know, but you just described criteria by which normal conventional loans are made on homes and you're saying we're not subject to the same criteria. Is there any zoning considerations or uh, parking regulations or code regulations that will um, that the property will have to comply with, will have to be 100% in compliance with all existing rules and regulations when it comes to zoning, parking, sprinkler, um, conformity? Yes, with, with the exceptions of the modified standards that are in the, that are specifically called out in the pilot legislation, zoning would have to be complied with, parking, et cetera, all the other code requirements would be uh, uh, in effect and would have to be complied with. Uh, you, you mentioned except for what's the exceptions? Are, yes, the, the local law has proposed changes or to the standards set out in the building code, the housing maintenance code, and the fire code with regards to it would mandate sprinklers, it would change the ceiling height, it would mandate uh, hardwired interconnected smoke detectors, it would mandate other uh, safety features like the occupant evacuation opening, um, egress stairs, egress components to the, it has very specific detailed requirements for this program. Other than those, all of the balance of the requirements would be in effect. And of the 8,000 homes, the 425 that were surveyed, of the 8,000, that, that's roughly a half a percent of the homes that could possibly be afforded this opportunity. How is that lottery system going to be done? Who gets to decide this, the lottery winner for Community Board 5? So the, the program participants will be selected by doing the following. First, um, the public engagement unit will be reaching out to potentially eligible homeowners. So those Maybe a within. slew of people that I would imagine right. are going to be extremely excited to find out there that they be. can get $250,000 and not have to pay it back to improve their home. You're going to have a number of homeowners that are going to be excited. So Who makes that decision right. at the very end? So let me, let me walk through it. So first of all, the loans are not $250,000. Um, the process will be the initial outreach. For those that are interested, um, based on the initial outreach, there will be a follow-up call that will um, involve an initial home assessment. The initial home assessment will um, 
uh, we'll, what we'll do is collect data about the physical conditions within the basement or cellar, look at feasibility of modification given the legislation, um, as well as whether or not the homeowner meets the basic eligibility criteria. So household income under a certain level, as well as um, whether they own and live in the home. Um, once we come up with the initial list of eligible applicants that are interested and where the modifications are feasible within the legislative legislation um, we're discussing today, um, we will prioritize homeowners um, based on a number of factors. Lower income homeowners will be prioritized first. I, I wanna go back to the loan. Um, the change of CFO will also yield an increase in the real estate taxes. So ultimately should balance out where there will be no net gain for that property owner. And when you decide that criteria, which is very vague, of who would qualify for this loan, yeah, I hope the homeowner is educated on the potential increase in real estate taxes that's going to come about the CFO change and increase from a one to a two, a two to a three, and so on. Uh, but, but that being said, so there is a waiver, there will be no violations issued for work without a permit for homes that have been illegally renting out these basement apartments, correct? Can, can, you, can you ask that again? Sorry. I'm, I'm, just, I'm talking specifically about homes that currently have occupied illegal apartments. Mm -hmm. There will be no violations issued to those homeowners for the con illegal conversion or the work that was done without a permit. For Is that an exclusion? Part for participants in the program, it's... You know. The 8,000 that you are potential P potential homes that would qualify. Mm -hmm. A slew of them, as you have admitted, have illegal apartments. Correct? To, we were estimating that they do. So now these homeowners are excited to potentially legalize their apartment, get the money that's needed to improve their property. Will they be at any time subject or targeted as for the illegal rental or the illegal work that was done in the homes? They will not be targeted for enforcement actions for participating in the program. The reason for that is because of the- Not for participating. Community. They there, are- Well, no, no. you know, I just wanna be clear that there is not, you know, there's still going to be areas of the city where 311 complaints will come in um, and we will go through our normal investigative uh, process and in some cases that could be in or around this community district. However, this is a path created for uh, under this program, um, and the reason that somebody who may have a tenant in the unit can still participate without the city uh, moving to vacate that that's not a good outcome for that for us is that there will be a community-based organization who will be. Um, doing the face-to-face -face interaction with the homeowners, and so they will not really interact with HPD um, until closing day, in which case there will be a relocation fund set up for existing tenants should there need to be uh, somebody that needs to be relocated. But I, I was trying to point out, is it buyer beware uh, that these homeowners should be concerned um, of advising you that they currently have illegally occupied apartments? Um, and they should be assured that if they come forward and apply, and if they're, whether they're fortunate or not to be a beneficiary of the pilot, that they shouldn't be targeted. Or maybe they should be targeted. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. well, what is it that we're you're, you're make... looking to achieve here? Sure. We, my okay. concern is that we have a number of apartments citywide that are death traps. And part of the problem is New York City that allowed it to go on for decades, including in the 60s where there were inspections made of every private home. And if you had a finished basement back then, I think it cons consisted of a bathroom and a summer kitchen. 
your tax class was, or, or your, the classification of your home was increased. It went from a one-family home to a two-family home, and you were taxed as a two-family home because you had a bathroom and a kitchen. Regardless if it was rented out, regardless if it was owner-occupied. So for decades, homeowners have been paying real estate taxes on something that the city allowed to exist, taxing them as an additional family unit, allowing them to jeopardize the single largest investment because God forbid of a catastrophe or a tragedy, there's no assurances that the insurance would cover a claim and now we have tens of thousands of units that are potential death traps, subjecting the occupants to not only carbon monoxide, um, but no second egress in case of a fire, living in very dangerous conditions, while the city benefited from the additional revenue through the real estate taxes that it generated. And today, we're ready to spend $11 million for 50 apartments at an average of $220,000 for a specific lucky fortunate community board where that would be about 50% of the value of the average medium home in that area. We don't know who's going to select the homeowners or by which method, it's too loosely defined. We don't know if that will ever have to be paid back. We don't know if the loan to value ratio is going to put that home on there in default. We don't know if that homeowner is going to be targeted now because they did apply. While, in short, the juice is not worth the squeeze on this one, folks. We got it wrong. And I really do hope my colleagues see how we just haven't grasped this the right way and that they vote no until we come up with a clear criteria. I'm afraid of a major crackdown in that area afterwards where homeowners will start calling in 311 calls because they weren't the fortunate one to be selected and we're going to begin a process that we don't know where we wind up ultimately. And there's no guarantee of a stabilized apartment, rental, the rate increases, and you're not even specifying uh, homes that have these illegal apartments that we can potentially correct what may be a very hazardous condition. You're leaving it open to a homeowner that may have an unfinished basement, unoccupied, which should not really be the case here. We should give an opportunity and make it where those homes that do have these illegal apartments that may have even been paying taxes for it and not even aware that it's illegal or this criteria. We don't know if they're going to be ADA compliant. We have a number of, of um, handicapped residents that this should be afforded to. We don't know if it's going to be targeted to seniors, which is another vulnerable group, or even homeless. The variables are going to be so loosely defined, of allowing for all sorts of interpretation and advantages to be taken. You got it wrong. You're spending money unwisely. You can do it for a fraction of that, and it should be available to the entire city and not to one select community board. And if they are occupied, this relocation fee, which can take up to 18 months, is going to displace that family or that individual, and it's just not economically feasible, the approach that you're taking. And we have to be more careful and wiser how we spend taxpayer dollars. It is half the cost of the home for an improvement to legalize 
an apartment, which I would imagine won't require much in the form of legalization. If you chose correctly, making it available to more homeowners. So hardwiring, sprinkler, I'm with you, I'm safety first is a priority. But when it's 50 homes, where it should be 500 homes that you can help with basic architectural and engineering plans that are needed, the homeowner would gladly participate in this program. You're not prioritizing the needs and the amount of money that's being spent is uncalled for and absurd. It's insanity. For 250000 up to $250,000 for a loan that may not be repaid, may not have to be repaid. We can do a lot more with this. You grab the bull by the tail and not the horns. And you should have called in the experts to help you put this together. The real estate industry could have helped you out tremendously on this. I'm not talking about major developers, the local realtors. Can I ask my colleague if he could? The architects up? and the engineers could have given you a tremendous amount of input on this, on how to get it done right. So council member, a lot of what you've just gone through are, are reasons why we think this makes sense to do as a demonstration program so that we can explore some of these issues and understand the implications and whether or not it makes sense for this to be a wider initiative. Save the money, bring the experts in, let them explain to you how this can be done, how it can be done citywide, and how it can be done in a very cost-effective manner. Thank you, Council Member Thank Janai. You. Thank you. I have a couple of comments. East New York has been a neglected community for many decades. Many of the homeowners there owned their homes because they were inherited from their parents. The median income in East New York Community District, Community Board 5, is about $36,000. And yes, some of those homeowners are right at that category, which is why initially you had said that it would be targeted for families at $120,000, and we said, that's only a handful of people. So it said families under $120,000. This is, as has been said, an idea, a project, a demonstration, an opportunity to find out how in the future this program might be expanded to anyone in the city, any homeowner in the city, and set the parameters for the amount of loans that can be given or grants that can be given matched to all of the factors that have been presented. I think it's a grand idea. There are lots of things that we can look at to refine it, to make it better, but for us to not address East New York, which has the highest foreclosure rate in the city, and not try to make an effort to do something to relieve those persons of that. Yes, it's gonna take a lot of training and financial education and uh, opportunities for people to get a better understanding of all that's involved should they decide they want to participate in this program. Someone on my block said, Councilwoman, I, I think I want to get into this project. And I said, yes, but be mindful of the other kinds of consequences that might uh, arise from being a part of this project. So there's a lot that we still have to look at, but that's a part of what a demonstration project is, works out all of those kinks. And with that, uh, I'm going to turn it back to my colleague, Councilmember Espinal, and he's going to continue from there. Thank you, um, Councilman Barron. Uh, we have Councilman Brad Lander wants to ask a few questions. Uh, just w uh, one or two things on redirect, I guess, as they say. Um, first, I just want to make sure I understand it right that on the affordable housing subsidies, the framework for what we're using here are the sa is the same framework we have broadly for affordable housing subsidy programs. There's state enabling legislation, HPD in different forms over decades has been doing 
homeownership lending with an approach much like this one, leaving aside the, the building issues for a long time, yes? Yes, that is accurate. And the kind of instruments and tools, again, leaving aside the DOB uh, issues that you're using here are just broadly similar to and based in the structure of those programs. I think um, the, you know, we have created this, the financial assistance um, using some of the structures that we've used to make home repair programs, including uh, looking at the type of technical assistance and support homeowners need, what other um, challenges they may have and need support with in order to be successful. So we've used that basic uh, framework and then um, built some additional support in because of the complexity of the renovations that would be taking place here. And then, you know, so just on this set of kind of lending and affordability and subsidy questions, this, this sits within the, the broad existing affordable home ownership framework that HPD and the city have had for a long time. Yes, this certainly the cost, um, you know, the range here, you know, we're, we're, we're budgeting up to $120,000 per home. The range here, we don't know what it's going to be at the end of the day because we haven't done the pilot or the demonstration program yet. Um, but even if it's $120,000, that would be comparable or less uh, to creation of a new affordable unit in the city. Okay. Which we've done a meaningful amount of. We've chosen to invest subsidy dollars in targeted projects to create new home ownership or home ownership with rental opportunities. Yes. In a lot of places all around the city. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, and I guess just, to, and I think this was clear from the beginning, but I just for the record want to make sure we're all clear. The, the goal in this case, so even if we just judged it narrowly by what we're trying to achieve for East New York, we would be sitting within an established policy framework of promoting homeownership all over the city. But here, even beyond the benefit to the homeowners that benefit from the subsidy program, we're hoping to learn things that will help us scale this program far broader that we might be able to do with less subsidy or make available to people in different income situations so that the benefit we'll get here is not only uh, the affordable units, but hopefully uh, a good broad policy that can help us yes. achieve substantially affordable housing throughout the city. That's right. And, you know, there, there has been a lot of estimates and questions for a long time about this uh, as a policy solution, and we think we're attacking it head on. And we think we actually got this right to do this legislation in this way. You have a table of experts in addition to consulting with architects and engineers, design professionals, and which people will rally around for the demonstration program um, as well. So there, this is a, a hot topic. This is a big question. Um, and we're approaching this in a way where we can put a huge amount of value in this evaluation, in the experiences we learn, so that we can be informed uh, when we look to solutions going forward. And we might even learn things about home ownership that have nothing to do with basements that has residual value as well. I want to point out on the cost as well and just be on the record on this. The 160000 to 260000 estimate, that's under the current code. We're estimating that just the provisions alone can reduce the cost between 30 and 40 percent. But we'll learn, as Commissioner Darga said, what exactly those costs mean. Um, the other thing, too, is the infrastructure of setting up a whole new scope of work for both us and for community-based organization. It's not an appropriate apples and apples comparison to say it costs this much per unit. The reality is we're not uh, spending more than we do on a typical preservation unit, but the amount of learning and partnerships uh, we think is going to pay off big time one day. And maybe you said this before, but I hadn't heard it before, uh, so I just want to make sure to underline this. So you th we think that the adjustments to the building code, the modifications that we're making through this legislation have the potential to reduce the cost of regularization, of making a unit kind of up to what the new code will be by 30 to 40 percent. That's our kind of hypothesis going into the demonstration program, and that's what we're hoping to learn more about. Great. I mean, that's obviously a significant achievement if we can achieve it and well worth testing in this context. All right. I don't know that any of our colleagues were basing what they'll, how they'll vote on this legislation by watching this uh, hearing on, uh, on repeat, uh, but if so, I hope they'll be mindful of these issues and, and join us in supporting and voting yes for this legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Williams. 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony. I had to step out um, for some meetings, so I missed a chunk of it. I'm not going to ask questions. I just want to lend my voice of support uh, for this bill and let it be known how exponentially important it is that um, we not only get through this um, pilot, but we expand it as quickly as possible. Um, a few years ago, uh, there was a well, there's been a few stories about me lately, but uh, this was a few years ago about a basement apartment I had in a home I purchased when I was 28 years old. Not sure what I can legally say or not say. I would say I would not be able to afford a home uh, had I not done uh, some things. Uh, and actually, I'll say I lived in the basement myself, which in, by law is actually illegal. I could not have afforded to pay for a home without have living in the basement myself. And so it is a, a critically a needed uh, form of housing in this city uh, and has been underground literally <laughs> for far too long and I think it makes sense that we have a program where we are bringing as much housing as possible and attaching it to affordability. This is the type of thing and ingenuity that this people are wanting government to do. So I just want to make sure I lend my voice uh, support. Thank you and thank you for the bill. Councilman Lander. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, we're going to call the next panel. Thank you. Thank you. William Spizak, Catherine Leach, Tyrone McDonald, and Byron Todman. So uh, again, I had four, Brian Todman, Tyrone McDonald, <clears throat> Catherine Leach, and William Spizak. Okay. Um, Elena Conte. You can begin uh, when you're ready. I just ask that you state your name for the record before you begin your testimony. Kate Leach from the Citizens Housing and Planning Council. Good morning, Chair Carnegie uh, and members of the committee. My name is Catherine Leach, and I am a policy analyst at the Citizens Housing and Planning Council. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. CHPC is a nonprofit independent housing research organization that has studied the topic of basement conversions for several years. We have reviewed the proposed legislation and applaud the council's innovative and forward thinking efforts to establish this demonstration program. We are in support of this proposed bill. This program signifies a critical step towards opening a new supply of rental housing without having to increase permitted density, change zoning, increase the height of buildings, or pay for land. Basement apartments inherently rent for less than comparable above grade apartments, and they provide a secondary source of income for homeowners. Many cities like Toronto, London, and San Francisco have embraced similar programs to unlock this vital source of rental housing. Furthermore, due to our housing pressures, New Yorkers are already living in basements whether we want to accept it or not. Homeowners who want to bring basements up to code face a tangle of technical requirements. Even the cost of evaluating the existing conditions and assessing the feasibility of a conversion can be prohibitively complicated and expensive. We must offer a clearer, simpler path for homeowners to provide safe and habitable conditions for their tenants. 
CHPC research has estimated that there are between 10 and 38,000 basements in single family New York City homes outside of flood zones that could be converted into rental properties. This legislation encompasses two family homes as well as sellers, so the potential supply citywide is likely even greater. CHPC enthusiastically supports this proposed legislation, which will directly address the barriers faced by homeowners by providing administrative and code relief, financial assistance, and technical support. Crafting this initiative as a demonstration program, the city will be able to assess how effective the code relief and homeowner support are in expanding the supply of housing and fostering safe conditions for tenants. Though starting small has its merit on such a complex topic, we must not stop with a few dozen units in a single neighborhood. This demonstration's successes and challenges must inform future efforts to make basement apartments legal, habitable, and above all, safe. We are grateful to the many city agencies, nonprofit organizations, and stakeholders that have collaboratively enabled this program's creation. CHPC offers its full support to this effort and its services as a housing research organization. We have researched this topic extensively and are submitting for the record a report and analysis of the regulatory hurdles faced by homeowners who seek a basement conversion. This winter, we're hosting an event called the Housing Innovation Lab, which will showcase new ideas, approaches, and technologies that can improve the safety and habitability of basement apartments, and we invite you all to take part. Thank you very much for inviting us to testify at this hearing, and please reach out if you'd like to learn more about CHPC's research on this topic. Thank you. All right. Sorry. Good morning, council members. Uh, my name is uh, William Spizek. I am the Director of Programs at Chaya CDC, uh, based in Jackson Heights, Queens. Our mission is to build the power, housing stability, and economic well-being of South Asian and Indo-Caribbean communities in New York. We also lead the Basement Apartment Safe for Everyone, or BASE, campaign. And I'm excited to be here uh, today to talk to you about the promise and potential of basement apartments. Before I speak as the Program Director of Chaya, I want to share a personal story. Uh, I was born and raised in Queens, the son of immigrant parents who worked hard all their lives to become homeowners. Uh, they bought a single family home uh, when I was young and uh, uh, that's where I lived during my high school and early college days. However, in my late teens, my father left the family and paying the mortgage fell to my mother who worked a part-time job at a corner store and to me, a college student with a part-time gig at a hardware store. We considered renting out our basement to help us pay the mortgage. However, on our block, two other families were fined for doing just that. We assumed whoever reported them would also report us, and the fear of financial ruin caused us great anxiety, so we opted against it. We tried to hold out for a couple of years with the hope that I would graduate and get a good job, but we couldn't last that long. Two months after losing the house, I did find decent employment that could have helped me save my home. Today, my family has no wealth or assets to speak of, and it hurts me to think about how this all could have been avoided if I had the opportunity to rent out that basement apartment, at least until I was able to find a better job. There are thousands of homeowners who find themselves in similar situations across New York City today, many willing to take the risks I was not and rent out their basements illegally. Likewise, there are thousands of tenants that depend on such units for affordable housing in a city that is prohibitively expensive to live in and becoming worse every year. We believe the city should establish a program such as this to support the legal conversion of as many basement apartments already in use as possible while adhering to reasonable safety standards and encourage low to moderate income homeowners who have yet to rent out their basements to explore the possibility of doing so with public support. The East New York pilot program and legislation is an important step in that direction. I'm giving you the abridged version. <laughs> so I just want to skip ahead to what will legal basement conversions do for New Yorkers? One, it will protect tenants. Tenants in basement units are highly vulnerable. Allowing for the legalization of safe basement apartments would provide additional protections for these tenants who currently have no recourse in housing court. To ignore the stock of basement apartments in use today is to relegate the most vulnerable New Yorkers, many immigrants and uh, low wage workers to a precarious tenancy with the constant threat of eviction, harassment and poor living conditions hanging over their heads. 
Not only is this bad for housing stability, it is bad for the health of the tenants. A three-year study Chaya conducted of our counseling clients found that tenants who feel insecure about their housing stability experience mental and physical health ailments at a much higher statistically significant rate than tenants with secure housing arrangements. Two, it will increase affordable housing. As mentioned before, New York City is facing a housing crisis. We desperately need real affordable housing that people at 50%, 40%, 30% AMI, et cetera, can actually afford to live in. Three, it will help LMI homeowners. Owners who illegally, illegally rent their basement units can face crippling fines. Many of these homeowners are victims of predatory lending whose homes are at risk of default. Predatory lenders will often convince a family they can afford to buy a home on the premise that they can rent out the basement. In neighborhoods such as Jamaica, Richmond Hill, and across South Queens, loss of rental income has contributed to a rise in mortgage defaults. Allowing homeowners to rent out basement units would supply owners with rental income that would prevent foreclosures and stabilize neighborhoods. And lastly, four, it will, stable, it will stimulate economic activity in LMI neighborhoods. Creating more affordable housing where rental income goes to LMI or low to moderate income homeowners instead of corporate landlords will provide an economic, economic stimulus to LMI communities. It is well established in the economics literature that lower income households have a higher propensity to consume and local residents living in one to four family owner occupied homes are likely to spend and reinvest their money in their neighborhoods rather than taking rental income from residents and investing or spending it elsewhere, in many cases outside of New York altogether. In a time of growing income and wealth inequality, we should support affordable housing plans that generate wealth for our working and middle class families instead of real estate investors, speculators, and private equity firms. It is clear that the benefits of a basement conversion program outweigh the cost. This legislation makes common sense adjustments to building codes that would allow for more basement apartments to be converted into legal units at a lower cost. We believe this legislation needs to be passed and the pilot project needs to commence so we can learn how to efficiently convert the city's stock of basements into legal living spaces for families to enjoy. Chaya CDC wants to see this pilot project in East New York happen successfully, but we are determined to make sure that it does not end there. This is a program that should become citywide. We believe there are many other neighborhoods that can benefit tremendously from a basement conversion program. As housing counselors and advocates, we see many cases in Richmond Hill, Jamaica, Jackson Heights, East Elmhurst, and all over Queens and know the role basements play in the lives of LMI homeowners and tenants. We know that people depend on these units. Chaya looks forward to working with the city to bring these units out of the shadows and grant the tenants and homeowners the dignity, rights, and protections they deserve. Thank you. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Is it on? No. I got hit it. Oh, now it's on. Uh, good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, uh, the City Council Housing Committee, um, for the opportunity for allowing me to um, testify on such an important um, subject with such gravity. Also, especially wanted to thank uh, Councilwoman Barron for extending this, this invitation here. Uh, my name is Tyrone McDonald, and I'm um, Government and Community Relations Manager of Neighborhood Housing Services of Brooklyn. Um, Neighborhood Housing Services of Brooklyn CDC is a community-based not-for-profit organization dedicated to promoting economic empowerment and neighborhood sustainability since 1982. Uh, we accomplish our mission through providing home buyer education, financial literacy, low cost home improvement financing, foreclosure intervention, and advocating for resiliency and sustainability as a solution to address issues of climate change in coastal communities. Uh, we are led by local residents and community stakeholders. We partner with businesses, government to advance the best interests of the communities we serve. We have offices in East Flatbush and Canarsie, and we cover neighborhoods such as East Flatbush, Canarsie, East New York, Flatbush, uh, Cron Heights, Flatlands, Mill Basin, Brownsville, and Kensington, to name a few. Our home improvement service was our flagship program since our inception to address the issue of redlining where thousands of low to moderate uh, income homeowners, mostly African Americans and Caribbean immigrants, who were locked out of financing to meet the basic needs of repair and upkeep. Our home improvement program, with the help of our partners, in addition to our tenant services, has brought our organization face to face with the repair needs of homeowners in Brooklyn. A basement seller legalization program offers a great deal of opportunities to homeowners and the city as a whole. The obvious being that it creates additional housing opportunities where none existed before among one to four unit homeowners. We know all too well about the housing crisis, one of the largest the city has faced since the Great Depression, leaving shelters swollen with families 
and a record number of human souls languishing in the streets. According to an October 15, 2018 New York Times article titled Homelessness in New York City Public Schools is a Record High, one out of 10 public school students lived in temporary housing during the last school year. We don't expect the basement cell legalization uh, to cure the housing crisis. However, it's another tool to address a multi-layered problem. Additionally, the program potentially allows homeowners already renting homes to, elite, elite, uh, to, to, uh, to come out of the shadows. As a consequence, this program has the ability to improve the health and safety of first responders, renters, and homeowners if it's owner occupied. Owners will be required to furnish once illegal units with smoke uh, carbon monoxide detectors, have two points of egress, and meet other fire codes. In 2014, we can't forget the horrific fire at 1434 Flatbush Avenue, not too far away from our Church Avenue location where one person died and 16 were injured. The three unit mix, uh, the three unit mix building with a church on the ground level had illegal apartments subdivided on the top floors and the fire was, the call, it was caused by the electrical overload. While basement seller program was not involved in this instance, it illustrates the potential safety and health dangers when illegal apartments are kept hidden. The legalization program offers additional income to homeowners, especially seniors who are already cost burdened. According to the Furman Center 2016 State of New York City's Housing and Neighborhood Report, half of homeowners in the city are cost burning, meaning that they spend more than 30% of their gross income towards mortgage and other housing related expenses. We at NHS Brooklyn hope the city would expand the current program proposed in East New York to include neighboring communities in Canarsie, Brownsville, East Flatbush, Flatbush, and other neighbors throughout Brooklyn. The expansion will hopefully allow NHS Brooklyn to be administrator of the program. We also encourage that rental units remain affordable to renters within respective neighborhoods and, and urge that homeowners, like first-time home by education, are offered landlord training by community-based organizations so homeowners are fully prepared for the responsibility of being a landlord. Thank you. Chair Carnegie, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify and thank you for hanging in there on this hearing. Um, I'm Elena Conti, Director of Policy at the Pratt Center for Community Development. Pratt Center is pleased to support the proposed legislation, which would pave the way for a groundbreaking pilot program to convert existing informal units into safe, healthy, affordable housing with legal status, providing protection and support for homeowners and tenants in the neighborhood of East New York. This legislation and the pilot that it will enable are the long and hard fought products of steadfast organizing and advocacy of visionary community based organizations, CHIA CDC, the Coalition for Community Advancement Progress East New York, and Cypress Hills LDC, among others. We have been partners in their efforts for more than a decade, co publishing the study we all heard about earlier today, New York's Housing Underground, which revealed that there are more than 100,000 estimated, you got it already, right, earlier. Um, living in informal units in basements and cellars across the city, but particularly and especially concentrated in the immigrant and communities of color in the eastern reaches of Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx. And since that point, we have looked closely at New York's housing stock. We've drawn on the experience of other jurisdictions nationally um, and those of other experts in the field uh, to develop and call for solutions that would stabilize these communities. These community efforts, joined by partners in the City Council, resulted in the 2016 commitment from Mayor de Blasio to advance the pilot. And now, after participating in more than two years of interagency and community collaboration with Councilmember Espinal, Barron, Lander, and the administration and others, we can affirm firsthand that developing a pilot is detailed, painstaking work that has required deep conversation, collaboration, and compromise. And this effort is still very much in process. Um, we are glad to note that the proposed legislation allows for several very important changes, right? The elimination of unnecessary code restrictions that prohibit the conversion of units, right? Including unnecessary restrictions for units based on grade instead of safety features such as light and air, right? The provision of financing and other administrative assistance to facilitate the participation of the lowest income homeowners who would otherwise not be able to take advantage of code changes 
And deeply and importantly, and I really feel like we heard this affirmed over and over again, actually, about the structure of the program, um, but recognition uh, and resourcing of existing community-based organizations who have deep roots in the community to perform not only the outreach, education, and counseling for the pilot, but also to provide that essential buffer and safety and comfort, right, for a very scary, potentially scary process for homeowners. Um, so those all things are really important and great. Uh, and at the same time, there are several features that are important to the success of a pilot in East New York and an eventual citywide program that are outside the scope of this particular legislation. Um, so quickly, these include uh, additional homeowner incentives and protections um, to make it easier to participate as well as to guard against the destabilizing threat of predatory speculators. Protections and rent regulation for tenants. As noted, right, many tenants that are in these units are uh, just a stone th uh, throw away, one step, one problem away from homelessness, um, and their needs have to also be taken into account in sensible design. We need easier and streamlined processes for converting the most common and most commonly inhabited housing stock. Again, this is a pilot where we're gonna get a lot of information about this um, and about the best ways to do it, but we need pathways for converting two-family homes to three-family homes and three-family homes into four-family homes in order to actually meet the human need and not just the housing stock need of the challenge that we have. And finally, additional code changes, as could be enabled by city and state rules and laws that would increase the feasibility of the program and reduce conversion costs, um, including you know, moving to the international standard of seven foot ceiling heights for all units um, and removing unnecessary limitations that happen to be imposed by the multiple dwelling law. So finally, the impact, uh, the potential impact on the housing crisis for the city's most vulnerable New Yorkers um, with this program is tremendous, right? It's hard to refocus on that, right? Cutting through all of the details of this program, but this is potentially something that can provide safe, legal housing to 100,000 plus New Yorkers if we get it right, right? So we look forward to continuing to work with you all on it. Um, and of course, continuing to work with our community-based partners, partners and respecting their leadership on it um, in order to take advantage of this opportunity to derive lessons that can inform a more comprehensive program citywide. So thank you. Thank you all very much for your testimony. I'm going to call the next panel. Um, Robert Sanderman, Michelle Nugebauer, Brandon Lissman. Uh, you can begin whenever you're ready, but I just would like to say for the record, it's a pleasure to see Michelle Nugenbauer, who I've had the pleasure of knowing for a long time, and I'm going to say coming up under. And so having this opportunity to see you in this capacity really makes me happy. Um, I thank you personally for all the work that you've done in this area and other areas uh, for a very long time. So. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, testify before you today. I may skip over certain parts of my testimony. I am Robert Sanderman. I'm the Community Economic Development Attorney at Queens Legal Services, a borough office of Legal Services NYC. Uh, Legal Services NYC is a nonprofit organization that fights for poverty and seeks racial, social, and economic justice for low income New Yorkers. Legal Services is the largest civil legal services provider in the country with deep roots in all the communities we serve. Our staff assists more than 80,000 low income New Yorkers each year, and along with other legal service providers in the city. Legal Services New York City is at the forefront of the fight to prevent evictions, preserve affordable housing, and ensure that our clients' apartments are safe and that they are not subject to harassment in their homes. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to speak today on Intro 1004 and the importance of creating affordable units and helping homeowners avoid foreclosure. A significant part of Legal Services NYC's work is in the areas of tenants' rights, eviction defense, and foreclosure defense. In fact, we have dedicated a tenants' rights coalition office in Brownsville, which serves Community District 5, where Intro 1004 pilot will take place. This is an important bill for us because Legal Services NYC is part of the base program, the base coalition um, that was mentioned earlier. 
there are thousands of basement apartments in New York City's affordable housing stock. In New York City, single family homes account for 16% of all housing units, but many New York City homeowners experience financial stress with 46.8% of owners with mortgages paying over 30% of their income on housing costs. 95% of dwelling units that have not been legalized or located in the outer boroughs such as Queens, Bronx, and Brooklyn. Based on decades of work, of working with uh, tenants and homeowners, we at Legal Services know that legalizing basement apartments would afford greater protections for both homeowners and renters. I myself have represented many tenants who lived in horrible conditions, did not, did not have protection of lease agreements, and who were afraid to request basic repairs that dire directly affected their quality of life in the, in the apartment. Rents in New York City have sharply increased in the last decade. It is increasingly difficult for working class New Yorkers to find affordable apartments. Even many basement apartments in the outer boroughs are increasingly becoming out of reach for very low income clients. As for homeowners, especially in Southeast Queens, where our Queens office works, many homeowners are facing foreclosure because of difficulties keeping up with their mortgages. Creating a program through which these homeowners can convert their basement apartments into lawful dwelling units will give homeowners a legal option to subsidize their mortgages and avoid foreclosure. By supporting homeowners through the conversion process, it provides low-income communities and communities of color with the opportunity to build individually, individual and collective equity, have direct involvement in building the resources of the community, and remain in neighborhoods that are increasingly becoming too expensive for low to moderate income families throughout the city. Intro 1004 is an important step towards creating a comprehensive citywide program for lawful conversion of basement apartments, which will both augment our city's safe and affordable housing stock, as well as ensure the rights of tenants occupying those units. As with any pilot or demonstration program, monitoring and evaluating the program will be critical. The success of the pilot will also depend upon close collaboration between city and community organizing groups and Community District 5, which have deep roots in the community and are best positioned to ensure that uh, Community District 5 homeowners learn of this program and successfully participate in it. Throughout this pilot, monitoring the impact of tenants will also be essential. It will not be a good outcome if homeowners are permitted to improve and legalize basement units only then to displace their tenants or raise rents beyond affordability. BASE has advocated for a program that also provides tenants with the protections they need and, provi and provide long-term affordable housing, including by giving tenants protections that will disincentivize harassment by landlords and frivolous housing lawsuits. This is something that might also be explored in a demonstration program. To close, Intro 1004 demonstration is an important step forward for New York City. A program to enable the legal conversion of basement units makes good sense for our city because more than ever, we need to preserve affordable housing as well as the diversity that makes New York City great. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words before. Uh, I'm Michelle Neugebauer. I'm the executive director of the Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation. We are a not-for-profit community development organization that builds and manages affordable housing. We provide tons of housing counseling services to homeowners. We organize tenants in multifamily buildings that are experiencing disinvestment. And we provide an array of human services programs to the residents of Cypress Hills and East New York. We've done that all for the past 35 years. Our organization is also a member of the Coalition for Community Advancement. And the coalition is a group of houses of worship, of other community-based organizations, residents, and small businesses who advocated very fiercely during the East New York rezoning for deeper affordability levels of the housing to be built, stronger displacement prevention policies, local hiring, and more community facilities. I've also served for the past two years on the Citywide Basement Legalization Task Force. Throughout the public review process for the East New York rezoning plan, we brought to the forefront the dire straits under which East New York homeowners are living. These are really struggling low and moderate income homeowners who are, and, and a big swath of them are also senior citizens who are living in homes that were built at the turn of the century and most of them before 1920s. And they have tremendous capital repair needs. But our homeowners, um, many of them immigrants, have lots of grit, and they're determined to hold on to their piece of the American dream. 
Um, during the rezoning, we work very closely with Council Member Espinal to demand that the city address homeowners' needs. Uh, so we advocated for the Good Neighbor Tax Credit, a cease and desist order in our neighborhood, a moratorium on tax lien sales, increased organizing and education for low-income homeowners to really address all of their challenges. And another policy that we advocated for, of course, is the pilot program to converse convert basements into apartments. And we really see the pilot as a win-win. It, uh, it's an opportunity to stabilize the home ownership of these low and moderate income homeowners and provide safe and below market rate affordable housing to low income renters. There's strong, very strong neighborhood support amongst homeowners for such a pilot program. Um, many homeowners now, and you've heard the estimates, between a third to a half, are renting out their basements now. Um, and they are renting out at below market rate rents. But they are also living in fear that the DOB is going to be knocking at their door and slapping some very exorbitant fines on them for having those basement apartments. And homeowners are ready and willing to come out of the shadows. Um, they need the support, the financial support, and the expertise to make those repairs that would make their apartments legal. Um, we want to commend the city, particularly HPD, for the design of the basement legalization pilot. We find it's very promising in that it emphasizes strong outreach, the involvement of local partners, home ownership and financial education and individualized counseling, tenant relocation supports, and tenant counseling, and tons and tons of community, um, community and technical assistance for the homeowners. Um, we encourage the council, as my colleague just said, to monitor the pilot, troubleshoot with HPD any obstacles that could arise, reflect upon the lessons learned, and implement the program citywide. Make it a permanent part of the toolbox that HPD has to preserve affordable housing in this city. We have seen the preliminary term sheet for the pilot, and we're excited, particularly for the lowest income homeowners, to be offered forgivable loans for these retrofits. Um, our only qualm with that term sheet is that very high income, in our minds, for our community, homeowners earning up to 165% of AMI are also eligible to participate in the pilot. For our neighborhood, where the average homeowner is only earning 75% of AMI, we feel that's too high. Um, we're also concerned that investors might take advantage of the new flexibility in the building code in CB5. And we urge the council to investigate any ways that the pilot can be restricted, these new flexible building codes, to the owner occupants that would be participating in the HPD financing program. Lastly, um, we urge, as many that you've heard before, have urged you to include tenant protections and rent restrictions in the pilot. I thank you for your time and hope you'll be able to support this important piece of legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Braden Listman. I'm the Deputy Director of Homeowner Services at the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. I want to thank the Chair and the members of the Housing and Buildings Committee for holding this hearing and for allowing us the opportunity to testify. The Center promotes and protects affordable home ownership in New York so that middle and working class families are able to build strong, thriving communities. We have helped over 50,000 homeowners in New York since 2008. We are a strong supporter of safe basement legalization. As we have heard, there are estimated 100,000 illegal basements in New York City. These units can be attractive to many New York City renters because they are significantly cheaper than legal rental units. However, because they are illegal, they are unlikely to conform to modern safety standards. We are excited about this pilot and believe that East New York is an ideal neighborhood for the program because it has historically been one of the most affordable neighborhoods in New York City, where tens of thousands of working and middle class families own homes. Last year, the center released a report on homeowner and tenant stability in East New York which highlighted that current residents are facing high levels of housing instability. The median household income of 63,000 is lower than New York City's median homeowner income of 78,000. 
we found that 63% of East New York homeowners had unmet repair needs and that a quarter of homeowners had missed a mortgage payment in the last five years. We also estimate that one third and possibly as many as one half of small homeowners have an illegal basement unit. We commend the City Council and the de Blasio administration for leadership in creating this important opportunity for homeowners to access financing and improve the safety of basement units, which benefits both homeowners and tenants. Because of the program's great potential, it is important that we get it right. And therefore, we encourage the City Council and the administration to take the following recommendations into consideration. One is to limit basement conversion resources and eligibility to owner occupants. As we heard before, we are concerned that easing of basement restrictions could lead to further investor-led flipping in East New York, and we urge the City Council to limit the program eligibility to owner occupants. Two, ensure that project timing is set up for success. Our experience with past programs, like Build It Back, has shown that these types of projects are often more complicated than planned for. Providing housing counseling, processing financial information for homeowners, coordinating logistics for homeowners and tenants, meeting language access needs of program participants can all lead to longer timelines than anticipated. For this reason, we urge City Council and the administration to ensure that timeframes are reasonable to accommodate challenges both foreseen and unforeseen. And third, we also want to ensure that neighborhoods citywide will eventually benefit. For the reasons discussed here, we are enthusiastic about the choice of East New York as the pilot location, and we know that homeowners and renters in many other New York City neighborhoods would benefit from this program as well. Therefore, we believe that this demonstration project will be an excellent first step toward an eventual citywide expansion. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today, and we look forward to continuing to work with you to promote affordable homeownership in New York City. So I want to thank you all for your commitment to this to this work and to make sure that we have safe, affordable housing and that we are creative, but we protect the safety of not only the, the tenants, uh, but uh, take into consideration the transfer of generational wealth through home ownership and protect the homeowners as well. So thank you. This hearing is officially adjourned.